Oh, yeah, but I was cut off for this kind of life. All my life, I wanted to be a hard-boiled detective like Humphrey Bogart or Dick Powell or even Alan Ladd. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Well, this is great. Rain, rain, rain. I'll bet even the ducks wouldn't come out in weather like this. But me, I'm an idiot. I gotta go and take up a profession like being a writer. I couldn't take up something easy. Oh, no, not me. I gotta be a writer so I can be out on nice, cold, wet nights. Beating my brains out. Looking for an idea. Idea Deadline Oh, sure Mustn't forget that ever-loving deadline <laughs> What a way to make a living I could have stayed a reporter at the Star Times And had nice assignments Like listening to political speeches Or covering the opening of a new manhole Oh, no, but not me I have to write fiction do it the hard way. Hmm. Well, I might as well take the usual hand, open the usual door to the usual place, and hear the usual comments. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hiya. Coffee, coffee boy. Hiya, Dan. What do you say, Ed? Yes, that it, I want you. How goes it, Holiday? Oh, pretty good. Where's the makeup on page four? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hey, how are you? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hello, Susie. Anything in box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. What a character I am. Standing here in front of the wanted counter in a newspaper office while the rain runs down off my coat collar into my shoe. Mr. Holliday. I gotta ruin my last pair of... Huh? What's that, Susie? I said there's a message in box 13 for you. Here. Oh. Thanks, Susie. Don't mention it. Say, aren't you going to open it? Sorry. Not here, Susie. You know, you got all of us down here at the Star Times awful curious, Mr. Holliday, running that ad. Have I? You've been running it for months. Why don't you change it? Well, I haven't read it for so long, I've forgotten the words. How's it go? Don't you remember? Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. How about that? I still like it. You'd do a lot better with Adventure if you ran your picture with the ad. Oh, no, thanks. Just keep on running it the way it is. But, gee, aren't you ever going to tell us what you do for a living while you keep running that ad? Susie, same old question, same old answer. No. Well, if I'm not doing anything else, at least I've got the people at the Star Times curious. They'd think my brain cells were ten feet off first base if they knew why I really run that ad. Uh, maybe they are. Hmm. You can help a person out of great trouble and gain an adventure for yourself if you call Chester 8945 and ask for Carla Williams. Chester 8945. <laughs> Carla Williams. Hmm. Sounds like an interesting name. Well, I hope she's home. Hello? Oh, uh, this is the man from Box 13. Oh? Tell me, are you serious or was that ad just a joke? 
No joke, Miss Williams. Are you willing to try anything? Well, uh, that depends what's on your mind. I can't discuss it over the phone. Will you meet me? Of course. There's a little French restaurant down on Ledge Street. Meet me there in the cocktail lounge. Uh, what time? Make it 10 o'clock tonight. Tell the bartender you want to speak to Carla Williams. French restaurant on Ledge, 10 o'clock. Oh, uh, what block number? The 600 block. You won't fail me. You'll be there. Lady, if it were a winter, I'd come with bells on. This sounds like the beginning of a very interesting story. Beautiful woman in distress calls on struggling writer for help. Only she doesn't know I'm a writer and I don't know she's beautiful. What's yours, mister? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm looking for a Carla Williams. Oh, yeah. She's sitting over there in that front booth. Thanks. Uh, Carla Williams? Yes. Oh, oh. Carla Williams could be material for a love story or an adventure story. Or, uh, maybe both. And, uh, do you have a name? Oh, uh, yes. Dan Holliday. Ah. Uh, sit down. Oh, thanks. I'm, uh, agreeably surprised. I didn't think a person would get such a satisfactory reply from a water head. And I didn't think I'd get such a nice reply. You're wondering about me, aren't you? You're wondering why you're here. Naturally. Well, I'm being blackmailed. That's a very nasty business. I've been paying blackmail for five years, but tonight's the end. I'm to meet him in 15 minutes and make the final payment and get the letters. Well, that sounds like the end of your troubles. But is it? I can't be sure. That's why I need your help. But what can I do? Well, you can be there as, as a witness. You can make sure this is the end. You can see that I get the letters and get away safely. Oh, uh, lady, you need the police. Why? To make sure everything I've kept hidden for five years comes out in the open? Maybe a friend could do it. My friends would be the last ones on earth I'd want to know. Are you afraid? No. You advertised for adventure? Blackmail isn't my idea of adventure. I'm sorry if my trouble doesn't measure up to your expectations. The best I could do on such short notice. Uh-oh. Well, I guess I had that coming. Maybe this isn't your idea of adventure, but I do need help. I need help badly. Let, let's leave it at that. Now, that might appeal to my early Boy Scout training. Then you will. I always help ladies across blackmail wraps. Uh, what happens if your friend makes trouble? We can't make any trouble. He seems to have done all right for the past five years. There won't be any trouble if you're along. Here, reach under the table. Take this. Oh, uh, now wait a minute. This is a gun. Put it in your pocket. Don't let anyone see it. This is supposed to make everything all right? Well, you won't need it, believe me. I, I thought it would make you feel better. It makes me feel like a policeman. And I still think a policeman is what you want. But you promised. I said maybe. I have to meet him in 15 minutes. Please help me. <sighs> Where do we go? His apartment. Far from here? We can make it if we leave now. What do you say? Maybe I should never have been a Boy Scout. Watch Carla Williams closely as we ride over to the apartment where she's to meet this man she's been talking about. She's perfectly groomed with a certain niceness about her, except for those twin furrows of worry between her eyes and a cold look of anxiety. I don't think I would like to have her angry at me, though. That's funny. You should have been here 20 minutes ago. Huh. Uh, why don't you try the door? It was unlocked. You might as well wait inside. Unless you have any objections. Not at all. There's a light switch on your right. 
The living room is straight ahead. Say, you sound like you're familiar with the place. Why not? I've been here many times before. There's a light on in there. Suppose he might have fallen asleep? Waiting for his money? Hardly. Well, this is more like it. This spot is nicely furnished. With my money. But at least we can sit down and make us... Make us... Oh, no. Miss Williams, what's the matter? What happened? Look the floor by the desk, look. You stay here. Well, well... You'd better call the police. He's dead. Dead? Yeah, he's been shot. Once. Through the heart. I'm glad. I'm glad. He's the one? The man who was blackmailing you? Yes. Would you... Could you go through his pockets? He must have some of those letters with him. Look in his coat pocket. Uh, just a minute, Miss Williams. You don't understand. This man has been murdered. What? We've got to call the police. Murdered? What makes you so sure? There's no gun around any place. Just the same before the police come. His pockets, please. I've got to have those letters. Okay. But it isn't right. Are these what you wanted? Let me see. Yeah. Yeah. They're all here. Now, where's the telephone? We've got to get the police up here and fast. There is no phone. No? How do you know without looking unless... I told you I've been here before. Oh, yes, I forgot. Well, go downstairs. There's a pay phone in the lobby. Tell the police to come up here right away. Then come back and we'll wait for them. You're not planning to leave while I'm downstairs, are you? No. Here, here's a nickel. Just dial O and tell the operator you want the police. Hurry. But you... You'll be here. Call, I said. <laughs> I wanted adventure, so I put an ad in a newspaper. And I certainly found what I wanted. Only this isn't good. The man is lying dead on the floor of this apartment. And Carla Williams and I will have to get down to the police headquarters and answer a million questions. All of them embarrassing. Uh, I hope she's made the calls. Say, that's funny. Why would there be a telephone directory in a place where there's no phone? Or maybe there is one. Of course, right here in the hallway. I wonder why she said there was no phone here. Maybe it's been disconnected. Hmm. Operator. This is the operator. Oh, fine. I've written a dozen stories like this. And whenever I've reached this point, the hero always finds that he's been framed. <laughs> framed. The gun. Yeah, I gotta look at that gun. Gotta find out if it's been fired. One shot has been fired. And the police surgeon will probably find a bullet from this gun in that dead man's body. The police. Seems like little Carla took care of that. <laughs> Me, I'm going to take care of something else. I'm leaving. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. <laughs> Once again, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, right now I'm wishing I were half as smart as the heroes of some of my stories. I've got a murder, strange woman, a strange apartment, and a strange feeling that this might not work out to a happy ending. What I need is a cab, a quick trip home, a short drink, and a long, long think. Sure is a rotten night to be out. Yeah, it sure is. Never seen such rain. Not so good. Cops are sure busy tonight. Sounds like it. Wonder who they're after. I uh, wouldn't have any idea. Could be a murderer, you know. Yeah, just could be. Just a night for a murder. Perfect. How come you got so wet? It's uh, raining. <laughs> I know, but how come? My umbrella needs recovering. You want the Normandy arms? 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's your building up ahead, but it looks like you got lots of company. What do you mean? Them's prowl cars, mister. All over the place. Oh, this is very nice. Carla Williams called the police and must have mentioned my name in passing. <laughs> I'm the type of interesting young fellow that any cop would like to meet. Especially with a murder weapon in my pocket. Tonight, Mr. Holliday, I think you will sleep elsewhere. Want me to pull right in where all them cops are? No, they look busy, so maybe we'd better not bother them. Just keep on driving. But this is where you live, ain't it? I don't feel like going home tonight. I could shove them cops aside, you know. This is legitimate hack. Uh, that would be fun, but don't bother. And you're the boss, mister. Where to? Uh, there's a place down on Franklin Avenue. 1612, I think. I know that place. That's the cheapest hotel in town. Yes, I believe it is. Hey, how do you know about a place like that? I got information there for a story. What a joint like that. What are you going there tonight for? To sleep. You writing another story? I'm living one. Living one? Yes, I left my typewriter at home. Well, Mr. Holliday, to what do we owe this great pleasure? Maybe you're just lucky. More research on the seamier side of life? No, not tonight. I'm looking for a room. A room? Might I remind you, Mr. Holliday, this ain't the Roney Plaza. Have you got a room? Any particular exposure you might like? The less, the better. I'm sure we can fix you up. That is, if you're willing to pay in advance. Buck, buck and a half, how much? Twenty-five dollars, Mr. Holliday. Twenty-five dollars? And if you committed the murder, it'll be fifty dollars, Mr. Holliday. Come on, talk straight. I don't want any trouble with the police. What makes you think I'll cause you trouble with the police? A little box called the radio, police calls. They're a lot of fun to listen to, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, I'll bet they are. You'll be comfortable here and safe. I'm beginning to wonder if I could afford it. With your money? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I wasn't trying to. Where's your phone? The one on the wall costs a nickel. Thanks. You're staying tonight, Mr. Holliday? Got back there in a hurry. You? Where are you? Still in town. What about the police? They with you? What do you think? Thanks for putting in a good word for me. I had to. They made me. Look, I, I want to talk to you. I know that feeling. I want to talk to you, too. I can explain everything. Like a gun with one bullet fired? Yes. A missing telephone that wasn't? That, too. Oh. Then you're just a little girl I want to have words with. Can you come over here right away? Are the police there? Oh, that's right. Name a place, I'll meet you. The corner of 6th and Victor, 10 minutes. Right. Follow me, Mr. Holliday. Oh, where to? Your room. This ain't the Roney Plaza, but the service is just the same. I've changed my mind. You're not staying? Your rates are too high. I'll drop in again after I've made a fortune. Now I know how the fox feels when the hounds are closing in. Hmm. Someday I'll have to write a story about a fox. Put that guy Burgess and his Peter Rabbit out of business. Hey, cab! Oh, it's you again. Yeah, I get around, don't I? I thought you were set for the night. No running ice water. Six and Victor. Where did you say you wanted to go? Sixth and Victor. But there ain't no place to sleep there. Oh, I'm not sleepy. I just want to examine a fire hydrant. Okay, mister. I'm glad it's your money and not mine. If we keep on, it will be your money. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Say, uh, is that tonight's extra line up there? Sure. 
Want to take a look at it? Oh, yeah, thanks. That picture they got of you on the front page is lousy. What picture? You look like you was facing the camera through a screen door. Yeah, let me see that. Well, 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 this is just wonderful. Prominent writer named by police. Carla Williams accuses Dan Holliday of the murder of Harry Granger. Grief-stricken girl witnessed the murder of her fiancé. Well, nice going, Carla. It's your word against mine, plus the evidence against me. Now I know why they wrote that song, I get along without you very well. Well, there's six and Victor. Cruise on by. You ain't gonna stop? I haven't made up my mind. Looks like a couple of cops waiting around for somebody. That's the way it looks to me. That might be the law. Yes, they might be. What do you want to do now? Get away from here and find a city directory. A chap by the name of Harry Granger should have a home. And he should have stayed in it. I'm either just ahead of the police or right behind them. And if this game keeps up much longer, I'll be right with him. Yeah? Oh, um, Harry Granger live here? He did. You the police? Well, no, not exactly. A reporter? I used to be. Come here, you. I wonder if you're one of them blackmailers. Just a minute, friend. My coat rips easy. No, I guess not. If you were, you wouldn't be here. Mind if I step in? Come in, come in. This whole thing's got me all upset. You don't say. Oh, uh... You said something about a blackmailer. That's what I'm here for. I came to help Harry get rid of those rats. You mean he was being blackmailed? For five years. I lent him most of the money to pay off with. I told him he was a sucker, but it looks like I got here too late. You heard what happened? Saw it in the papers on my way from the station. Have you told the police? Not yet, but I'm going to. Who did you say you were? I didn't say. You know something about this? I think I do now. I began to see the light when the city directory listed this place as Granger's apartment. Can I help? You might get into trouble. Well, how? Breaking into a woman's apartment. After this, I'll use a fire escape and more of my stories of the most interesting things about a building. Homicide will be out in the hall seeing that no one comes in here. I'll have to work fast, Holloway. You'll have to find something that the police weren't looking for. There must be something. Bills, letters, cards, that's no good. Look, look for the obvious. That's, that's what I always have my hero doing. Let's see, what's the obvious? Oh, the living room. Now, let's see. That's where the body was. Nothing obvious there. On the desk. No, no. The table. No. The fireplace. Hello, hello, hello. A small frame snapshot. And I think it might be just what I'm looking for. My old friend, the bartender, and Carla Williams. And with your arms around each other. You know, you two make a nice couple, a wonderful couple. I wonder if they'll let you have your arms around each other in the electric chair. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I finally made it. I'm down at police headquarters in the office of a tall, gangly character named Lieutenant Kling. Of course, a few things have happened. Carl and the bartender were brought in, too. It's so much cooler than I am. Oh, those cell bars give you such fine ventilation. Holiday. Um, what's that, Lieutenant? I said you were a very lucky citizen. After what Carla Williams told us, we thought you were guilty. If she'd have told me that story, I'd have believed it myself. Approving that she and the bartender were married put a crimp in her act as the injured fiancé. Yeah, you showed it up as the same old racket. Smart woman teams up with smart man to blackmail innocent citizen. But just the same, I think you should stick to your writing and let police work alone. Uh, Lieutenant, I'll have that printed and framed in blonde walnut. 
Hang it on the wall? No, around my neck. I'm glad to hear you say that. You may not always have a guy like this Grant who backed up your story. Oh, uh, Granger's friend? That's the one. Say, he's a nice fella. Wants me to visit him on his ranch. Why don't you do that? Riding the range all day when I could be cooking in town? Uh, pardon me. Homicide, Lieutenant Kling. Oh, yes, yes, he's here. It's for you, Holiday. Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Susie. Yes, Susie. Can you come down to the Star Times right away? Well, what's the matter? There's another letter for you in Box 13. Oh, no, no, no. Should I uh, open it and read it to you? Oh, not now, Susie. I I've got enough material to last me for a month. Three weeks of which will be a rest. Tell me where. M maybe I can come down and help you. You really want to help me? Sure I do, Mr. Holiday. Then put that letter back in Box 13. But, Mr. Holiday. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Well, this is great. I come to the park to get a hot idea, but the day turns out hot, and my idea turns out cold. Idea. Well, I thought I'd find something different in a public park, and I did. A small boy mashing his ice cream cone against my brand new trousers. And all to meet a deadline. Deadline. Story idea. <laughs> Why didn't I do what I should have done in the first place? Copy. Copy, boy. Hi, Mr. Holliday. Hiya. Hey, Smith, where's the lead on that fire? Hiya, Mr. Holliday. What do you say, Bill? Jones, where's that interview? Hiya, Dan. How are you, Joe? Where's the makeup on page four? Hiya, Holliday. What's a good word, boy? Hiya, Mr. Holliday. Hiya, Susie. Anything in box 13? <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Go to the park and get a story idea about romance. Sure, why not? What do I come back with? Gravel in my socks, sand in my shoes, and a June bug in my hat band. Holiday, why didn't you pick a different profession like driving a coal truck? Mr. Holiday. Uh, uh, what's that, Susie? I said there's a message in box 13 for you. Oh, thank you, Susie. Thanks so much. Don't mention it. Say, you got a faraway look in your eyes today. Yes, but only as far as the dry cleaners. Dry cleaners? Have you ever had a small boy wipe his ice cream cone off on your trousers? Oh, <laughs> girls don't call them trousers. In our set, it's slack. So it is, Susie, so it is. Well, see you later. Okay, if you say so. But I still don't like that look in your eyes. You look like you might get into trouble. You know what I think after spending the day in the park? What? Trouble will be a welcome relief. Why 
why did I ever have to decide to be a fiction writer? I could have stayed a newspaper reporter. I could have kept on writing those snappy obituary notices and worn a hat that turned up in front and shoes that did the same thing. Well, better see what's in this envelope. Hmm. If you want real adventure, be at the corner of 7th and Main at 10 p.m. tonight. A black limousine will pick you up at that time. Do not try to engage the chauffeur in conversation. Uh, what's this? No signature. Oh, ho, no signature. Black limousines, chauffeurs who won't talk. Meetings on street corners at 10 o'clock at night. Well, this should be interesting. a black limousine. And look at that chauffeur. This way, Mr. Holiday. Oh, uh, mm, thanks. What a character this driver is. He looks like he spent his nights on a nice cold slab down at the morgue. Wonder if I can get him to talk. Uh, driver. I said driver. Oh, uh, chauffeur. Oh, you. Oh, uh, oh, pardon me. Through there, Mr. Holiday. So you do talk. <laughs> I was beginning to wonder about that. This way, Mr. Holiday. Uh, 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 who's that? It's only me, Mr. Holiday. That black suit, it. Makes you almost invisible, you know. Yes, I know. Uh, follow me. You're curious about the way you were brought here. Did it frighten you? Maybe. Maybe not. This room, please. <laughs> My office. Well, this is very cozy. Well, I'm glad you find it so. To eliminate a lot of questions, I'd like to say this. I know all about you. Uh, all? You're a successful writer... Apparently, you fear nothing, and I would presume that some of your adventures spring from that ad you run every week in the Star Times. Did you find it interesting? <laughs> Adventure wanted. Will go any place, do anything. Do you catch many people with that ad? I caught you. Or is that vice versa? <laughs> I had you investigated, Holiday. I know where you live, what you do. The newspapers have told me of your experiences. Hmm. What are you leading up to? You'll notice I had you brought here by a devious route. I wanted to be sure no one knew you were here. Go on. How much do you know about insurance, Holiday? A great many people buy it. A great many don't. And of those who do buy, a great many intend to defraud, to steal from their insurance company. Now look, this is a racket. I'm not interested. My name is Abner Blake. I'm the chief investigator for Northern Insurance. Oh. Do you remember the disappearance of Dr. Max Alexander? I read something about it. Why? He carried a very large policy with us. He's been gone almost seven years. When his seven years are up, the law will permit his widow to collect. And Holiday. Yes? I don't think Alexander is dead. This man has the coldest, frostiest eyes of any professional man trailer I've ever seen. And he's loaded with energy. Energy which I'll bet has helped him track down the people who tried to cheat his insurance company. Boy, I'm glad I'm on his side. If you'll think back, Dr. Alexander performed a very delicate brain surgery on a prominent man. The operation was not successful. I remember that. He was criticized in some circles for taking a chance. Immediately after the patient died, Alexander walked out of the operating room, the hospital, and so far as we've been able to prove, right out of this world. But I still feel that he's alive, somewhere. And you believe it's an insurance fraud? I'm sure it is. And I have a reputation, Holiday. No one has ever attempted to defraud Northern Insurance and has been successful. You, uh, suspect Mrs. Alexander? Hardly. She's barely left her house in all these years. She receives no mail except from her daughter. Her daughter? Uh, she lives in New Mexico. What about your regular men? They've looked everywhere. They've come up with absolutely nothing. Police? Same thing. And you're afraid you'll have to pay off? No. Not if I have a smart man, a resourceful one, 
a man who can be as relentless as I am. And I think that man is you. If Shakespeare were alive, he would cast Abner Blake in the role of Macbeth and throw him an extra part as one of the witches. <laughs> but that's no affair of yours, Mr. Holliday. You've got to find a man who's been gone for almost seven years. And if you were the hero of this story, you'd go to the files of a newspaper and look into the past. Well, if it isn't Dan Holliday, what are you doing down the morgue of the Star Times? What would anybody be doing down in the morgue, Mac? Well, some of them just lay there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know me, Dad. I, I just got to have my little joke once in a while. Now, uh, what was it you're looking for? Oh, uh, the clips on a citizen named Dr. Max Alexander. What have you got on him? The works, Dan. The whole works. Prominent man dies following delicate operation. Doctor criticized for taking chance. Dr. Alexander walks out of operating room and disappears. Grief-stricken wife employs private investigators when police fail to find Dr. Alexander. Dr. Alexander given up for dead. Not a bad-looking citizen, the doctor. He's been shot from more angles than this Philadelphia at Atlantic City. Kindly eyes, intelligent face, strong chin. Yes, doctor, when I see you, I'll know you. And I hope to see you soon. Yes? Oh, I'm Dan Holliday, Miss Alexander. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about your husband. My husband is dead. Well, some people think he isn't. They found something... They think he's alive. Come in. Now then, Mr. Holliday, who are you? And why are you looking for the doctor? Uh, a commission from the insurance company. I hoped you might give me some information. It was on all the front pages. That's exactly as it happened? Yes. He was never seen again. Oh, Mr. Holliday, if only you could find some trace of him. I'm going to try. You don't know how terrible it is. Almost seven years. But still, I've had the feeling that he'll come back someday. You look for me, too. Well, of course. I miss him so. What about your daughter? After her father's disappearance, she couldn't stand it here in town. She went to our ranch in New Mexico. Oh? Her father's disappearance broke her heart. I... I pray you find him. Mrs. Alexander, so do I. Mrs. Alexander is a grief-stricken old lady. One who sincerely wants her husband back. So, where to look first? This is the build-up to the main story, Holiday, and if you're smart, you'll... you'll bring in all the characters. Where to, mister? I want a drawing room. To Albuquerque, New Mexico. Well, Holiday, you've got a railroad ticket and an hour to make the train. Better get back to your apartment. A quick shower, pack your bag, and get on your way. We've been waiting for you, Mr. Holiday. Well, gentlemen, is this a pleasant intrusion? And I hope you are gentlemen. We were positive you wouldn't mind. Oh, of course not. People break in here regularly. Good. Sit down. If you don't mind, I like the air up here. As you wish. I understand you like to travel, Mr. Holliday. Travel? A wonderful pastime travel. Ever think of uh, South America? Often. You see, I'm a common Miranda fan. How would you like to go to South America? For me. All expenses paid. For as long as you want to stay. What would I have to do? Just forget a few things. Like New Mexico? Particularly New Mexico. Give me about two weeks and I'm your man. You don't seem to understand. You're leaving. Tonight. Well, that's what I mean. But I'm going west. No. South. You and I would make a nice compass together. Now, suppose you point north and walk right out of this apartment... Oh, and don't forget your gorilla. You mean Spencer? 
If that's his name, I mean Spencer. You'll hurt his feelings talking that way. Well, that makes us even. Just looking at him hurts mine. Is it uh, South America? In a way. At least I'm showing you the open-door policy. Now, get out, you and your gorilla. Spencer. I wouldn't recommend that. So? I said get out. Have you ever stopped to consider something, Mr. Holliday? What? You may never get to New Mexico. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, well, now you've got all the ingredients for a story. Insurance investigator doesn't believe doctor is dead. Wife doesn't believe doctor is dead. Two men try to stop Ryder from making further investigation. All right, Holiday. Write the rest of the plot. Well, maybe you'd better hit the sack. This is very pleasant. I've got a comfortable drawing room, and I'll bet it's got a thousand springs to ease my worries. Uh oh, the man with the urge to send me to South America. Well, I've got something for him. Go. <laughs> Now, fellow, what's the big idea breaking in here? I'm sorry. I must have come into the wrong drawing room. You came into the wrong apartment a couple of hours ago. Now, what do you want? I just want to go to sleep. In my traveling bag? I was looking for my razor. I wanted to shave. You just had a close one. Come on. Where? To find out if you got space in this train. If you haven't, we'll make some for you. Under guard in the baggage car. <laughs> This is fine. I couldn't prove a thing. My friend had space, and to the conductor, it seemed like a perfectly logical thing to mistake car 19 for car 18. I wonder who this man is and who's in back of him. Next stop, Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Well, that's the end of the line for me. And I hope I don't mean that too literally. <laughs> Long distance? I, uh, I want to speak to Catherine Alexander at the Bar Cross Bar Ranch just outside of Belmont. Yes. Hello? Uh, Miss Alexander? Yes? This is Dan Holliday. Wonder if I might come out to the ranch and see you. Oh, you're the man who's looking for father. Mother wired me about you. Was it complimentary? Mother said she believed if anyone could find Dad, you could. Come right out. I want to talk to you. And I want to talk to you. Cab, mister? Yeah, ever hear of Valmont? Sure did. Know where it is? Sure do. Mm, uh, very far? Sure is. Uh, can you take me there? Sure can. You got enough money to pay for the trip? Sure have. Let's go, then. Sure thing. This is New Mexico holiday. Breathe deeply and treat your lungs to a shot of straight ozone. <sighs> Twenty miles to Valmont, and all you've seen on the whole trip is four buzzards, three in the air, and the one driving. And if he's a cab driver, I'm a flying disc. Car behind. Yeah, so I hear. Wants me to pull over. Don't do it. Know them fellas? One of them is Spencer. Friend of yours? That depends on what you mean by friend. I gotta pull up. Those guys are gonna run me in the ditch. Can you fight? Nope. Then can you recommend a good dentist? What fur? Something tells me that when this is over, I'm going to need a new set of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> 
You feel better, young man? Yeah, thanks. Uh, what happened after those two fellas jumped me? Who are you? My name is Moran. I'm the caretaker up at the Bar Cross Bar Ranch. I was coming down this way when you were forced off the road. Oh. Well, what happened to the driver? Last I saw of him, he was just a cloud of dust. <laughs> I remember now. I got out of the car. He drove away. Those two fellows started to beat you up good. When they saw me coming, they ran off too. Hmm. You had a mighty close call, young man. I had three of them. After this, my luck runs out. Somebody after you? And vice versa. Say, uh, how far is the ranch? Half a mile up the road. <laughs> Better take it easy. Come on, I've got to get to the ranch. Feel you can make it? My friend, I've got to make it. <laughs> This is not good. Spencer and his grill have followed me all the way out here trying to stop me at every turn. Maybe I'm getting warm. But if that's true, why hasn't someone else found Dr. Alexander? Here's the ranch house, Mr. Holliday. They say Miss Catherine was expecting you? Yes, but hardly in this condition. You're Dan Holliday? Well, what happened? You're all beaten up. <laughs> So this is Catherine Alexander. What a beautiful girl. And what beautiful eyes. You'd better lie down, Mr. Holliday. You're badly hurt. Oh, no, thanks, Miss Alexander. I, I don't feel that bad. I just look that way. Anything more I could do, Miss Kathy? Oh, no. No, and thank you so much. If you hadn't come along, Mr. Holliday might have been badly injured. Perhaps fatally. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Now then, how about a hot shower? You can get a rub down and change of clothes. Miss Alexander, you read a man's mind. Sometimes that's a pleasure. Depending on the man. You're depending on me? What do you think? Well, this is more like it. Hot shower, brisk rub down, little iodine on a few... Out, out, it stings. And Catherine was kind enough to loan me some riding clothes. That should indicate a sojourn in the saddle out on the desert, with the stars blinking their approval of my companion. Blinking approval? Holiday, you're an incurable romantic. Isn't this beautiful? That gorgeous sky and the stars. You love it, don't you? I always have. Always will. Have you been here long? The Bar Cross Bar belonged to my dad. We used to come out during the summer. Now I live here all the time. Alone? Oh, there's always Moran. Moran? <laughs> he's a strange old fellow. <laughs> People around here say he's a little <laughs> touched. But he's been wonderful to me. Oh, uh, say, those men who jumped me down the road. Moran, ever seen him before? How could he? They were strangers. Oh. Your, uh, your mother told me you've been searching for your father a long time. Yes. Mother and I have spent a fortune on private detectives, investigators, following up leads. But nothing ever happened. Yes, I know. Oh, tell me, Miss Alexander. Kathy, please. Uh, Kathy, have you any idea where I might begin to look? I thought you might give me a starting point. Hmm. Not unless he would be back in the city. He just walked out one day. No one ever saw him again. Well, I'd better go back there and start from scratch. You don't have to leave. Right away. I'd enjoy staying a while. Maybe I have been lonesome. Perhaps I've forgotten what companionship can be. Perhaps. You'll stay a while? A while. Good. Good. Say, the time. We'll be much too late for dinner. Come on, I'll race you. You're on. Hurry or I'll beat you. I'm at the corral gate already. Kathy, look out! Kathy! Kathy. Mr. Holliday, what happened? You're racing. The horse stumbled over that lower bar and threw her. 
Look at that gash in her head. Oh, she's unconscious. I, I hope she isn't seriously hurt. Oh, stand there, man. Get in the house. Call a doctor. Yes, a doctor. A doctor. Hurry, will you? Of course. Get into the medicine cabinet in the house. I need some bandages. She may be suffering from multiple contusions. Multiple contusions? Or even a compound skull fracture. Hurry, will you? Compound skull fracture? I don't know if you can find it. Hurry, I said. There isn't much time. Okay, Dr. Alexander. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, now I'm back in the city again, walking up the street towards that same grim gray house where I first met Abner Blake. Up the steps, Holiday, and write the final chapter. That was a nice job, Holiday. I was nice about it. What do you mean? You didn't see the look in Dr. Alexander's eyes when he recovered his mind. And that lovely, lovely girl being mixed up in a deal like this. If you feel sorry for her, you're making a big mistake. Yes, I know. She was following him the day he walked out into the country. She'd almost caught up with him when a hit-and-run driver knocked him down. That's when she got the idea for the Disappearance Act. Why not? The doctor's face had been so damaged no one would ever recognize him. And he'd lost his memory to top it off. We've got the daughter and the mother in custody. Uh, just think, if she hadn't have fallen off that horse, I might never have been able to prove that Dr. Alexander was alive. I know. Hiding him on his own ranch was the daughter's idea, too. Why not? No one would pay attention to an old man puttering around the place? Uh, I've got a story, and I don't like it. Mother and daughter hide amnesia victim to collect insurance. Oh, excuse me. Blake speaking. Uh, yes, he's here. For you, Holiday. Oh, thanks. Hello. Mr. Holiday, this is Susie. Oh, yes, Susie. There's a message for you in box 13. Shall I read it to you? Now, Susie, you know you're not supposed to open my mail. But this is already open. It's a postcard. Oh, is it interesting? I think it is. All right, come on, come on, tell me what it says. It says, rental for box 13, $15. Oh, fine. Goodbye, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in... Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, box 13, box 13, box 13, box 13. Copy boy, copy boy. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What do you say? Where's that society page, please? Hiya, Holiday. Hiya. Jerk the first paragraph in that Simmons story. Hiya, Sam. How are you? Hiya, Susie. Hiya, Mr. Holliday. What's in box 13? You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13. 
starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, here I am again, standing at the want ad counter of the Star Times, looking for what? An idea for a story. Hmm. I could have stayed here as a reporter. I could have been searching for facts. Instead, I'm fumbling for fiction. Instead of a blonde, I'm meeting a deadline. Instead of Chanel number five, I'm heading for a snip of printer's ink. Holiday, you're a dope. Mr. Holiday. I... What's that, Susie? I said there's a letter in box 13 for you. It's special. Special? Special delivery. It was mailed only a couple of hours ago. Something like that could be important. Mm, could be. Could be adventure. Could be. Could be a, a girl. Could be. <laughs> By the way, Susie, how come you're working so late this evening? Oh, my boss asked me to. He's paying me overtime. Time and three quarters. Time and three quarters? Mm-hmm. I held out for double time when he offered me time and a half. Well, what happened? Oh, we effected a compromise. <laughs> Goodbye, Susie. Special delivery, huh? Well, this could be very important. Also, it couldn't. Well, come on, open it up, Holiday. You haven't got all night. I'm in terrible trouble. Please come to room 718 at the Bradford Hotel. Hurry. Signed, Agatha Marsh. Hmm, that sounds urgent. Who are you, young man? What do you want? I'm the man from Box 13. I'm looking for Agatha Marsh. I'm Agatha Marsh. Come in, come in. You're Agatha Marsh? But well, don't stand there with your mouth open. Never can tell who might be snooping around the hall. I'll find a chair and sit down. Now, what's your name? Uh, oh, Dan Holliday. Well, Mr. Holliday, I don't believe in drinking or I'd offer you one, but I have got some sauerkraut juice in my thermos bottle. Oh, uh, no, thanks. Just the same. I like you, Mr. Holliday. I liked your ad in the paper. Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. It was just what I needed. Well, thanks again. Now then, what's your charge? Charge? For helping me, your fee. Oh, that. No charge, Miss Marsh. Are you trying to be chivalrous? No, you see, I'm a writer. I'm looking for ideas. If I get a good idea, I consider I've been well paid. Well, that seems a little silly. Might I ask just what your trouble is? Oh, you don't think a girl my age could get into trouble, do you? Well, you look like a very charming old... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, lady, oh, lady, let's not beat around the bush. Now, no doubt you want to know a few things about me. Well, that would be very interesting. Yes, well, I live in Muncie, Indiana, alone. I've got a big house and an independent income. Every year I go someplace for a vacation, and this year I came here. Uh, is that all? Isn't that enough? But the letter you wrote me, you said you were in terrible trouble. Well, I am. If anyone ever finds out about this, I don't know what'll happen. Finds out about what? Come over here to the closet. I want to show you something. Look, on the floor. Boy, that's a dead man lying there. Well, this would make a good opening chapter for a story. Young man goes to help charming old lady who is in terrible trouble. Terrible trouble turns out to be a corpse. Corpse? Hey, wake up, Holiday. This is the real thing. Now, now do you believe me, young man? When did you find him? Just before I wrote you that letter. Before you wrote the letter? Well, that's hours ago. I know, but what could I do? What could you do? Miss Marsh, you could call the police. And get my name in the papers. Have all the folks back in Muncie know there was a dead man in my room? Oh, no. Miss Marsh, listen to me, please. There's a dead man in that closet. There's a law about dead men. We have to notify the police immediately. You can go to jail for hiding a body. Oh, fiddlesticks. But, Miss Marsh, look at this man. He's been shot at close range. There are powder burns on his coat. I know. I examined him before I wrote you. You see, I read all the current detective stories. Detective stories? This isn't a story. This is the real thing. I know. Why don't you try to prove that I did it? With what? A cap pistol? Now, you're a nice person, Miss Marsh, but this is going to be tough. Well, don't get so excited. A girl my age could kill a man if she wanted to. Um, rub him out, as they say in the murder mysteries. 
Please, Miss Marsh, be sensible. You've got a murdered man in your closet. Now pick up that phone and call the police right away. Mr. Holliday, in all seriousness, I can't do it. Think of what my lifelong friends would say. Yes, yes, I know it doesn't look I good. I can see the headlines now. Prominent Muncie pioneer woman found with dead body in hotel. Oh, please, Mr. Holliday, help me. Well, I don't know. This is a little out of my department. Just this once, Mr. Holliday. I've never asked for help before. I, I'm an old woman. Well, all right. What do you want me to do? I want you to help me get rid of the body. Get rid of the body? Now, look, Miss Marsh, you're not serious. You didn't mean that. Oh, you don't know me. I fully intend to get rid of that body. Okay, go right ahead. It's your course. And you're going to help me. No, no, I'm sorry. Try a bellhop. And have him snitch to the desk clerk. Besides, you advertised for adventure. But this isn't adventure. It's a nightmare. Come on, Miss Marsh. Let me notify the police. Now, there's a broom closet down the hall. That's very interesting. I I, I just remember I'm, I'm meeting someone in the lobby. I'd take the body there myself, but I'm not strong enough. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. I'll scream. Go right ahead. The hotel detective will show up. Just a man I'd love to see. And I'll tell him you killed that man. Oh. Now, would you help me? Suppose we get caught. Then you'll help me. Now, wait a minute. You said we. Now, I'll open the door and watch the hall. Uh, case the joint, as they say in the mysteries. And then you whisk the body into the closet. You're strong. You can do it. Oh, sure. I'm strong, all right. But not in the head. <laughs> Oh, this can't be happening to you, Holiday. You can't be dragging a body down the hall of the Bradford Hotel. You know better. And as soon as you can get away from this charming but cracked old gal, you're going to talk to the police. Harry, Harry, I'll open the closet door. Put him in right there. Stick him in good. Here, here we are. I must be crazy. Now back into my room before anybody sees us. There. Wasn't that easy? Easy, she says. Well, I must say you carry out your part very well. What's next in this little scheme of yours, Miss Marsh? Why don't you know? We have to find out who killed that Michael O'Brien. You know who he is? Well, I do now. I went through his pockets. Frisk him, as they say in the stories. Well, that cuts it. You stay here. I'm going downstairs. And... Who's that? Just keep cool. I'll handle everything. Oh, I can't believe this. It just can't happen. My name is Kling, Lieutenant Homicide Bureau. Oh, come in. Come in, won't you? I intend to. Holiday, what are you doing here? Hello, Lieutenant. Oh, do you two know each other? Never mind the social chatter. I thought this was some kind of a gag. Now I'm sure of it. Holiday, just what are you trying to dream up? If I told you, Kling, you'd never believe me. Sit down, Lieutenant. Uh, can I get you some sauerkraut juice? Well, I don't mind if... Uh, some what? Sauerkraut juice. Uh, no, thanks. Now listen, somebody, some crackpot, phoned in a tip that there was a dead man in this room. Why, Lieutenant, how can you say such things? Lieutenant, now listen. You'll be quiet. Miss Marsh, mind if I have a look around? Not at all, not at all. Here's the closet. Now then, you can see for yourself, Lieutenant, there's nobody there. Uh, I got your name from the desk clerk, Miss Marsh. Maybe you better tell me about yourself. I can tell you all about it. Now I was it... talking to Miss Marsh. Are you Miss Marsh? Right now, I think I'm dead. You will be if you keep interrupting. Go ahead, Miss Marsh. Tell me about yourself. Certainly. I live in Muncie, Indiana. I arrived this morning for a two-week vacation. I'm well known back there, and you can find out everything about me if you care to wire. Uh-huh. Uh, how did you happen to meet Mr. Holliday here? Look, Lieutenant, if you'll permit me to tell I'm you... I'm asking the lady. I went to school with his mother. That's what I did. Uh huh? see. Well, I guess it was the work of some would-be comic. But I had to investigate it just the same. Well, of course you do. Oh, but Kling, listen. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. So long, Holiday. But Kling, wait, I want to go with you. Why don't you two have a fast game of hearts? Mr. Holiday, wasn't that thrilling? Just like in the magazines. Miss Marsh, you're going to stay in this room until I get Kling back here. Oh, no, no, no. I want to solve this case myself. I wonder how Kling found out that 
Miss Marsh. Yes. I'm not the suspicious type, you understand, but a little bird, a, a tiny little bird, has intimated that perhaps you might know who tipped off the lieutenant. Of course I know. It was I. What in the world are you doing? I made the call from the corner drugstore a little while ago. I wanted to throw the lieutenant off the trail, like they say. You know what I say? No, what? You're going down to police headquarters and tell the truth. Oh, just a second. Excuse me, please. Yes? Yes, this is Miss Marsh. Oh, you did? I thought so. Yeah, it should have had 817 instead of this room. Oh, no, don't bother. I like it here. I knew it. I knew it all the time. What did you know? That was the room clerk. He got my reservation mixed up. I was supposed to get 817, and I got 718 instead. You mean the person who killed Michael O'Brien wanted to get back in here to remove the body? No, 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 it doesn't sound reasonable. No, it doesn't. Uh, well, guess who was supposed to get this room? Never mind, we're going to police headquarters. It was Tony Bascari. Tony Bascari? He's the biggest racketeer in town. He's dynamite. Miss Marsh, he's deadly. I know, Mr. Holliday, and I love it. Oh, no, no. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Two o'clock in the morning and I can't go to sleep. Oh, that little old girl has me worried to death. She wouldn't go to the police headquarters and when I went down and talked to Kling, he acted as though it were a big joke and sent me on my way. Hello. This is Agatha Marsh. Now what? Where are you? At the hotel. I went up to see Tony Bascari. You what? Miss Marsh, don't you know that's the worst thing you could have done? I had to talk with him. I put the heat on him, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you're still alive? I accused him of killing that O'Brien man. I came right out with it. But of course, he wouldn't admit a thing. What do you expect him to do, break down and confess? Well, I think I've got him on the run. But I'm worried. Oh, if I had Tony Bascari on the run, I'd be worried too. Because when I came back, I discovered someone had searched my room. Will you call the police? You should have done it a long time ago. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. I want you to come over right away. At two in the morning? Mr. Holliday, someone's trying my door. Hang up quick. Call the room clerk. But, Mr. Holliday, I'd... Hurry, I said. A dear little meddlesome old fool. In your clothes, Holliday, because here we go again. And don't forget your boy Scott badge. You'll make the Beaver Patrol tonight. The clerk said she hadn't called the desk. I wonder... No, she would have screamed. Someone would have heard her. It's open. Cleaned out completely. No Miss Marsh, no clothes, no nothing. Not even a piece of notepaper. Hey, what's this? Paper airplane. Like the ones I used to make in school. But why should she be making paper airplanes? Airplanes. The airport, that's where they took her. Keep that motor running, I'll be right back. Not many people around this hour of the night. Oh, there she is. And the man with her has his hand in his pocket, and I don't think it's there because it's cold. What I need now is a little fast talk and a little faster action. Okay, I'll take over from here. Uh, who are you? What are you talking about? The old doll. Bascari wants her back. Bascari told me to put her on a plane. I'm doing it. Yeah? Changed his mind. He wants her back. I don't think so. Besides, I never saw you before. I told you, if you don't turn her over, Bascari might get sore. Why didn't he call me? It's only a half hour ago. I was still at the hotel. He could have called. And spilled everything over our phone. 
You're nuts. This don't sound right. Ah, eh, forget it. I'm taking the old doll back with me. Wait a minute. I'm gonna call Tony first. Go ahead, stupid. Get your ears burned off. Who are you calling stupid? Show me something that'll prove Tony sent you. Got a match? Stop stalling. This is a gun in my pocket. Let's talk to Tony. Yeah, I, I've got some matches here. Thanks. Here. Oh! Get him, Mr. Holiday, quick. I'm coming. Oh, not so fast. Ooh, I, I'm not as young as I used to be. You should have remembered that before you got mixed up in this. Come on, get in. Would you push? Driver, get out of here fast. What did you do to that guy anyway? I, I stuck him with my hat pin. I might have guessed it. Now, Miss Marsh, what happened at the hotel? Well, I hung up when I heard him trying the door, but I was too late. The door was unlocked. So it was Tony Basqueri, huh? He wanted you out of town fast. Oh, but they were very nice to me. You can thank your lucky stars for that. Usually, Basqueri's enemies wind up in some ditch. I didn't see him again. That man, the one you knocked out at the airport, he was the one who came in my room. Well, you must have the goods on Basqueri. You must have killed this man or had him killed. But why didn't he take him out of the hotel right away? But there was a convention there last night. The whole place was literally crawling with people. Oh, that's the reason. Oh, that paper airplane. That was fast thinking, Miss Marsh. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> well, now we can go back to Basgari. We've got the goods on him. We can crack the cakes like they say in the murder mysteries. Miss Marsh, I've got news for you. We're not going to see Basgari. We're not? Well, where are we going? You'll hate me, I know, but it's the police station. Well, Holiday, what happens now? You've taken Miss Marsh to Kling's office. She looks at him. He nods her into his private office. And suddenly she comes out smiling. You try to leave, only Kling stops you. You stay here, Holiday. Kling, you can't let her walk the streets alone. Bass Carey will get her. Forget it. I got a man tailing her. Okay, okay, but what happened in that office? What did she tell you? Plenty, my friend. She preferred charges against you. She preferred charges against me? Now, what are you talking about? Kidnapping. I kidnapped her? You took her off the plane by force, didn't you? Listen, Kling, that little old lady is a whodunit happy. She'll get herself killed. There really was a body in the hotel, you know. Look, Holiday, do you know what you're saying? Sure, I know what I'm saying. There really was a body in that hotel. Holiday, why didn't you tell me? I tried to, twice. Once in the room and the last time when I came in here. Now think, Holiday, carefully. Where is the body? In a broom closet down the hall. I put it there. You put it there? Yes, I put it there. Holiday, get out of here. <laughs> Well, Holiday, now you're fixed. Even Kling looked at you like those things in your belfry weren't bats. They're more like eagles. But you're in it now, so you've got to follow through. And that indicates a fast ride over to the Bradford Hotel. Oh, clerk. Hey, clerk. Uh, yes? I'd like to find out who occupied Agatha Marsh's room the day before she did. Uh, that question is highly irregular. Oh? Then here's a $10 bill that's highly regular. Oh, <clears throat> uh, let me think. Uh, she has 718. She checked in day before yesterday. Yes. The man who had the room before that was a traveling salesman in uh, lady suits, I believe. Uh, he must have cut quite a figure. She must be in this hotel someplace. Her room's empty, but she must be around. But where? What are you worrying about, Holiday? You couldn't wait to get rid of her. Now you can't wait to get her back. Oh, you're a character who belongs back in the Middle Ages with a tin union suit for cold nights. Yes, yeah, she'll probably show up safely with that detective tailing her. The broom closet. Wonder if the dead man is still in there. He must be. Kling hasn't showed up yet. Oh, oh, oh hello, Mr. Holiday. Miss Marsh, what happened? How'd you get in that closet? Isn't this thrilling? 
No, it isn't. There was a detective trailing me, but he was knocked unconscious. Shopped, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you were brought up here? By the same man who tried to put me on the plane. He hit the detective, put me in the car, and brought me here. Well, you two, what are we playing now? And where is the man I put on you, Miss Marsh? He was hit over the head, Lieutenant, but I'm sure he's all right now. This the closet where you said the body was? Was is right, Lieutenant. Yeah, let me take a look. You know what I think, Holiday? What? I think both of you crackpots are making this all up. I don't believe there ever was a body. Kling, you have my word for it. Your word doesn't mean as much as a Chinese dollar. Kling, listen. They brought her back here, locked her up. They took the body away, didn't they, Miss Marsh? Probably going to sink it in cement, as they say in the murder mysteries. Mascari's in his room, I'll bet. Go up and talk to him. Surely, put the heat on him. Just once more, I'll play with you kiddies. Come along. Where? Miss Marsh's room. I'm locking you pixies in till I get to the bottom of this. Kling's been gone 15 minutes. I wonder what's happening up there. Not much. I haven't heard any shooting. No, that's... I haven't heard any... In that case, how could a man be shot here and that shot not be heard? Oh, it's very easy, Mr. Holliday. The, the killer would use this. Oh, Miss Marsh, now, where'd you get that gun? Just took it out of the drawer. It was here all the time. Well, put it down until Kling returns. But I just want to show you why the shot wouldn't be heard. What do you mean? Would you excuse me, please? You see this bath towel, Mr. Holliday? Yes, what about it? Well, a smart person would take the gun like this, wrap the bath towel around it like this, you know, Miss March, you found out a lot since you came here. Oh, yes, I've done all right since early this morning. Early this morning? But the clerk said... I talked to Tony Biscari and he said... Clang, look out! <laughs> Miss March, give me that thing. You shouldn't have moved, Mr. Holliday. I was really shooting at you. What's this all about, Holliday? What was she doing with that gun in her hand? She was going to kill me, just like she killed Michael O'Brien. That little old lady killing somebody... Miss March, you, you did kill him, didn't you? Then you called me, and you got Kling to come up here and catch me dragging the body away. Only he came a little late, as usual. Now, wait a minute, Holiday. Then when you couldn't pin it on me, you tried to hang it on Tony Biscari. Now, what did you do with the body? Dragged it back to the closet in this room. Oh. And I suppose you sapped the detective who followed you, too. It was easy. I got him to turn around and hit him over the head with my purse. Why did you kill Michael O'Brien? Did you have something against him? No, no, I never saw him before. Then why kill a perfect stranger? I saw a play once. I liked those ladies in that play. They killed lots of people. I wanted to also. Only I should have done it like the ladies. You don't mean arsenic and old lace. Yes, and I should have worn the lace and given you the arsenic. Well, Holiday, you're back in your apartment again. The sun is shining through the window, a sun you might never have seen again. You know, I've got an idea for you, Holiday. Give up this business and go into something quiet. Like night watchman in a cemetery. Holiday. Uh, well, what's that, Kling? They examined the old girl down at the psychopathic ward of the city hospital. She's batty as a loon. You're telling me. I saw that in her eyes when she wrapped the towel around that gun. But uh, what happened to Bascari and his stooge? When she heard he was in the room above, she tried to pin the body on him. Oh, so he tried to get her out of town in self-defense. Hmm. Holiday, you're a very lucky, lucky guy. You can say that again and again. And again. Oh, just a minute. Hello, Mr. Holiday. Susie, what are you doing up here in my apartment? Why aren't you down at the Star Times? Well, my boss and I have been talking about another compromise. Another one? He wants to fire me and I want to quit. Oh, but Susie, if you left the paper, what would I do for my mail? I was thinking... Maybe you'd like to hire a good combination stenographer and secretary, huh? That's you? That's me. 
Well, I don't know, Susie, but as they say in murder mysteries, I'll have to think it over. You better think fast. Good help is hard to find. Goodbye, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music was composed and conducted by Rody Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Holliday, why did you ever leave a soft job as a reporter? Order to become a freelance writer? Or why did you ever advertise for adventure? Oh, I know it makes you feel like a kid with a box of Cracker Jack. Now you can't stop. You might run across a juicy peanut, or that grand prize is supposed to come in each and every package. But you know by now that storylines, like money, don't grow on trees. Susie, where have you been? You know where I've been, Mr. Holliday. Down at the Star Times after the mail. Oh, yes, the, the mail. What's in box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. <laughs> I wish I'd never rented the thing. Wish I'd never even thought of it. Mr. Holliday, you're early this morning. Well, I had to see if my new secretary's on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> you know, since you rescued me from that nut factory down to Star Times, I'd work my fingers off the elbows for you. Uh-oh, now take it easy, Susie. You'll need those elbows to lean on when things get dull around here. Dull? Oh, things don't get dull around you, Mr. Holliday. Hey, what's that you're writing, a love letter? Yeah, it's a love letter to your publisher. Uh-oh. He wants to know where are the chapters you promised for the new book. And what are you telling him, Susie? <laughs> a lie. A big fat one. <laughs> Thanks. By the way, where are those chapters, Mr. Holliday? If I had them, my secretary would have lots of extra work. You don't like extra work, do you, Susie? Well, I don't like your worried look. When you don't have chapters, you have that look. Oh, uh, does it show so much? Like a chinchilla coat in a dime store. <laughs> it's the hallmark of my profession, Susie. Say, what was in box 13 today? Mm, some goof wants you should fly to Mars with him in his homemade rocket. Oh, brother. Oh, yeah. There was a ticket to a radio broadcast. Radio broadcast? Silky Soap presents Time for Drama, starring Gene Blake, 8 p.m. Federal Broadcasting Studios. Now, who would want me to go to a radio show? The advertising agency, maybe? Huh. Those guys don't read Adventure Wanted ads. Too busy dreaming up singing commercials. Someone wants you should go to that broadcast awful bad. Yeah. She wrote please in the back of the little envelope. She? Yeah, she. And I don't like her taste in lipstick. The one she wrote this with is the color of blood. And now you have returned, my darling. I am alive again. The wind is down, but still the seas run high. Time for Drama has presented The Wind is Down, starring Gene Blake. 
In the cast were Robert Baylor as John, Agnes Sloan as grandmother, and Marvin Masterson as the butler. This is FBC, the Federal Broadcasting Company. Sorry, sir, we're closing the studio. Huh? Oh, sure, sure. I, I was meeting someone. They, they must have stood me up. Uh, someone in the cast, sir? Yes, it could be. Uh, I think they've all gone, but you might try the stage entrance. Oh, thanks. How do I get there? Uh, around the back of the building, sir, just opposite the parking lot. <laughs> you blithering idiot. Watch where you're going. Sorry I didn't see you coming around the corner. You autograph hounds always clutter up the entrance. For that, I'll not give you mine. Step aside there. Oh, don't mind him, son. He's just an old ham. A has-been. Oh, that's a heavy hunk of ham. Who is he, Pop? The uh, name's Marvin Masterson. Not the Marvin Masterson. Yep. He's washed up in pictures. Threw on the stage, too. Does bits on the air now. Say, didn't I see him play a butler on Time for Drama tonight? Yep. How the mighty have fallen. Say, Pop, you read that like an actor. Hmm, was one once. Oh, nothing like Masterson, of course. But I can appreciate how he must feel. Well, someone else did, too, when he said, Fame, it is the flower of a day that dies when the next sun rises. Well, you an actor too, son? Uh, no, writer. Name wouldn't be Dan Holliday, would it? Yes, why? Got a message for you. Uh, from whom? I don't know. Found this note on my desk. If uh, Mr. Dan Holliday comes around, ask him to go to the Mayfair restaurant. Hey, what is this? I'm getting passed around like a, like a collection plate. When you catch up to her... Give her a pencil. That lipstick smeared up my call sheet. Ah, oh, Monsieur Halliday, it is an honor to have you once more at Mayfair. You have deserted us too long. Working hard, Henri. Always. But tonight, you relax. You have fun, eh, Monsieur Halliday? Mm hmm? What do you mean? A charming young lady waiting for you at your table. Oh, I'd, I'd hoped you'd come, Mr. Holliday. Why, you're... You're Jean Blake. Yes. I must talk with you. We'll order later, Henri. Now, what is this all about? Oh, I, I suppose I am being rather mysterious. I'm used to mystery. Besides not owning a pencil, what's your problem? Pencil? Yes, that lipstick you write notes with uh, comes off on things. Oh. I'm in danger, Mr. Holliday. Grave danger. Well, why come to me? I know about you in Box 13. You advertise adventure wanted. Will go any place, do anything. I need help, so... So? Mr. Holliday, I'm going to be killed. <laughs> I'll do anything you ask, but you must help me. You must. Oh, now, look, Miss Blake, I'm a writer, not a detective. Pardon, I... Monsieur Holliday. Yes, Henri? There's a call for you. May I plug in the phone? A call? Oh, sure. Uh, excuse me, please. Hello? You're engaged in an interesting adventure tonight, aren't you, Mr. Holliday? You must be psychic. Who is this? If seeing into your future is being psychic, I suppose I am. You see, when I ring off, I know you will tell that beautiful young woman sitting next to you that you can't help her. Oh? Surprised? Yeah, a little. What makes you so sure? If you don't send her away, you won't be able to help her. Or anyone else. That I don't see. Something else you don't see is a gun. It's aimed precisely between your eyes. No, don't look around. You can't see it from there. But an expert marksman can see you. However, if 
every move. You're, uh, you're in this restaurant? Interesting situation, isn't it? Hundreds of people around you, and you don't know which one you're speaking with. Or which will shoot you, if you don't do what you're told. Get rid of that girl, Holiday. Now! <laughs> Now, Miss Blake... You will help me. But, Miss Blake, But I... you must. You simply must. Look, I'll pay you anything. I don't want your money, Miss Blake. I want you to see the police. You won't help me? No. That's final? That's final. Very well. Goodbye, Mr. Holliday. <laughs> Well, nice going, Holiday. A young woman in distress pleads for help, and what do you do? Send her out into the night alone. But you had to do it, so that that madman on the phone wouldn't hurt somebody. Now you've got to find her and fast. Henri! Henri! Oui, Monsieur Holiday. That girl who just left, Jean Blake. Did you see where she went? Oui, Monsieur. She walked toward the park. <laughs> This is the park, but no Jean Blake. Oh, there she is. Miss Blake! Miss Blake, wait! <gasps> it's all right, Miss Blake. Oh. Stan Holiday. Oh, but I thought. No time for thinking. Get in my car quickly. <laughs> Tell me who's been threatened. And there's only one thing we can do. What? Go to the police. You can relax now, Holiday. You're off that hook. The Blake gal's probably back home, and you can bet they put a cop to stand guard at the door. Sure, Holiday, this would have made a great springboard for a yarn. But you're out of it now. So I'll just forget the whole thing. Anyway, what would you have done for the last chapter? Last chapter. Hmm. Of course, uh, if you should go back to the Mayfair for lunch tomorrow, you just might run across something interesting. <laughs> Aren't you, Dan Holliday? Yes. The author? I thought as much. I've seen your pictures on dust jackets of your very exciting books. I'm a fan of yours. Well, have a seat, Mr. Masters. Ah, you recognize me. Have we bumped into one another before? Well, I'd call it a near miss. But along with a few million others, I'd... I'd recognize you anyway. Personally, I detest dining alone. Since no one was with you, I took the liberty. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Henri, serve my dinner here. Oui, monsieur. Your voice is very distinctive, Mr. Masterson. <laughs> Seems I've heard it just recently. Of course. It was on the radio. I have been doing a bit of... That, you know. Simply <laughs> for amusement, of course. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I saw you on Gene Blake's show last evening. You played the butler. Ah, uh, yes. I asked them not to credit me. Yes, just dabbling with radio. Uh, a new medium, you see. Oh, I'm sure the name Masterson means a great deal, even to the radio audience. The public soon. I call Monsieur Holiday. The phone is connected. Oh, thank you. Hello? Hello, Mr. Holiday. It, it's going to happen. What I told you about. I know it is. If only you could come now. No! No, don't shoot! Oh, God! 
Hello. Hello. Good Lord. Holiday. What's wrong? Jean Blake. She's just been murdered. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Well, what a sleuth you turned out to be, Holiday. You sit in on a mutual admiration session with a tired old ham actor. And the gal you're trying to protect gets knocked off. Hold it, Mac. Where do you think you're going? Miss Blake's. Miss Blake ain't seeing nobody. Yeah, that's for sure. She's dead. Dead? Are you crazy, mister? I've been here all the time. Which part of the duplex is hers? Upstairs. But you can't... Come on. This it? Yes, but I... Come on, bust it in. See what I mean? Suicide, huh? What did she take? Suicide. You better look again. She was shot. That's impossible. I'd have heard something. I've been here six hours and I ain't heard no shot. But there were three shots. I heard them just 15 minutes ago. You heard them? You wasn't here 15 minutes ago. Or was you? Were you? I told you I've been here six hours. Didn't you leave for cigarettes or something? I told you I'd been here. Yeah, I know you've been here six hours. But who was around before I got here? No one. That is, nobody but them. Nobody but who? The tenants of the other apartment. An old guy and his daughter, name of Masterson. Masterson? Look, Mac. You know too much about this. I'm holding you till I get the inspector down here. Sure, and when you phone in, tell headquarters to send along a magician's manual. Huh? You didn't hear any shots. This thing must have been done with mirrors. Did you talk to Miss Blake after you left her last night? No, not till she phoned me this noon, Inspector. At the restaurant. She phoned you at the restaurant this noon. Yeah, that's right. I was having lunch with a guy from downstairs, Marvin Masterson. Well, I got news for you, Holiday. If you talked to anybody, it wasn't Miss Blake. What do you mean? She couldn't have telephoned you. She's been dead over 12 hours. How about that? Holiday. Holiday, where's that good ear you're supposed to have? Sure, you would swear it was Miss Blake's voice. But she was dead 12 hours before. Look, Holiday, you're trying to find the last chapter. But even you couldn't write this one. But it was her voice. Come on now, think, Holiday. What did she say over the phone? It's going to happen. What I told you about, I know it is. If only you could come now. <laughs> something else that came over that wire. Something a good ear would have picked up. If only you could come now. If only you could come now. Think, Holiday, think. What else did you hear over that phone? A clock. Clock sounding the Westminster Abbey chimes. Yes, coming. Yes? Miss Masterson? I'm Dan Holliday. Oh, yes, good evening. Won't you come in? I'm sorry to intrude. Oh, not at all. Father told me he lunched with you this noon. Oh, yes. Is your uh, father at home? No. Oh. Is there something I can do? 
Oh, yes, answer a few questions, if you will. Well, if it's about that poor girl upstairs, the police have already questioned Father and me extensively. Poor Father. He was so upset he went out to our beach cottage for a few days. I'd like very much to know... Can't you get your information from headquarters? No. Why? You see, I know more than the police do. Isn't withholding evidence a crime, Mr. Holliday? Yes. So is aiding and abetting a murder. I'm afraid that's not very clear. Some details are not clear to me. That's why I'm here. Are you insinuating that... No. I'm accusing. Accusing whom of what? A father and his daughter of murder and abetting a murder, respectively. That's ridiculous. I don't think so. <laughs> I get it. This is just a gag cooked up between you and my father. Well, it really isn't very funny. It's no gag. Your father murdered Jean Blake. And I believe you helped him, Miss Masterson. And now I'm sure of it. Is my silence that expressive? No, but your clock strikes the Westminster chimes. Chimes? I don't see what they've got to do with it. I see several things. Your fancy record player, for one. It does have an attachment for making recordings, doesn't it? Mr. Holliday, you have no right to ask questions. The police got all the information they wanted. But not the evidence to convict Marvin Masterson. I know he's a murderer. You'll have to prove that. This noon over the phone, I heard Jean Blake calling for help. Then I heard the shots had killed her. Well, if my father was dining with you at the time, how could he be the killer? I heard the murder, but not at the time it was committed. It was you, Miss Masterson, who telephoned me at the restaurant. Are you trying to say I'm clever enough to go through that shooting routine and then fake Jean Blake's voice over the phone? It was Miss Blake's voice, all right. However, I heard it 12 hours after your father killed her in this apartment. Later, he carried her body upstairs. That's fantastic. Is it? Mind if I go through this collection of records? I should find the one Jean Blake was forced to cut on this machine before she was shot to death. No, don't, please, I... Oh, you did play that record I heard on the phone. Yes. But I thought it was a joke father was playing on someone. He phoned me a few minutes before and told me what to do. What did you think when you discovered Miss Blake was dead? I was frantic. You see, Father warned me to forget all about the record. He refused to answer any of my questions. Mr. Halliday, my father can't be responsible for this tragedy. He's just a broken old man. He, he was the idol of millions for so long, and now they don't want him anymore. He, it's breaking his heart. And... Please. Please, I'm begging you to forget all about this, Mr. Halliday. I thought you might be innocently involved. But I'm afraid you can't protect your father from a murder charge. What will he do with him? I'm sorry, Miss Masterson, but but I'll have to take that record. Don't touch that cabinet, Holiday. Oh, you didn't like the beach, Masterson. I didn't go. You're too clever to be out of my sight. Being at this end of your gun might indicate otherwise. But I don't like guns pointing at me. Pete, get out of the way. He, he was going to shoot you. Oh, oh, you're so right. Fortunately, you got in the way. Are you convinced now that he killed Miss Blake? Yes. I'm afraid I am. How did you know it was done here, not up in Jean's apartment? Jean didn't have a clock which strikes the Westminster Abbey chimes. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. What is station high? Is a proud bendicant. It boasts and begs. It begs arms of homage from the throng. And off to the throng denies its charity. Holiday. Uh, 
What's that, Inspector? I said that Masterson was a fool. Imagine his insane jealousy of a young performer leading him into a murder plot. Oh, I know, but after all, look at it from Masterson's viewpoint. He'd been a great star, now he was reduced to playing a bit. Hmm. Support of a girl he considered an upstart. Yeah. Well, it's too bad. Yes, his thinking went awry on him. He figured if he got rid of her, they might rebuild a show around him. Uh, the old boy was nutty as a peck of peanut brittle. Well, Mr. Holliday, should I go over to Star Times and see what's in Box 13? Oh, not this morning, Susie. Today we work. Chapters for our publisher? Chapters for our dear publisher. Good. Oh, say, before we start, there's a letter here for you. A letter? What's it say? It's from the man who owns the apartment building where you live. Yes? It says, your rent is past due. Get it up or get out. Oh, fine. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hedegar with an original story by Frank Hart Tossig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting like being a truck driver with the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holliday? I went down to Star Times' office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. <laughs> Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in Box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gag. Some small girl selling 10 cent packages of flower seeds for 50 cents. Sell 5,000 packages and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. <laughs> well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, Kara Box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. 
I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Well, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of businesslike. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny, and tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, where would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? <sighs> you interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holiday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holiday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. What was on page five? Well, here. I got a clip in the story. Read it. Police announced they had recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. Just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Oh, uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Oh, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. You know what? What? The old DA just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Mm. But I'll bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holliday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I'll I... bet you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holiday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? The story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. The district attorney will see you now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, thanks. Holiday, haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, eh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but what could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, this stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims a man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. 
Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while a detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with the holdup men. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? <laughs> we don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. Day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write Benita the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I'll bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. I gotta earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. <laughs> All boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny. There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. You know him? Uh-uh. He's going through the place, though. And he's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. He just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. He's not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny! Johnny! Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Willard. The woman who sent Moran after the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. And I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Phillips. No, I feel terrible about it just the same. And now Johnny disappearing... He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of that. Oh, uh, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps she'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we'll talk. Oh, thanks. Uh, did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling Holiday, waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. The oldest gag in the world, and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holliday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's, she's long and skinny. No, no, she's short, short and fat. 
Holiday. Holiday, get up on How your feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right? Answer me. Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday. Walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holiday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holiday. One big How do you effort. feel, Mr. Holiday? I I I can't can't make it. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Take it easy, Holiday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better? Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with a district attorney. I've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holiday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, or else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's Office, Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was the hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago. The victim of a hit-and-run driver. <laughs> And on top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holliday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Oh, Mr. Holliday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you weren't to do too much talking. So just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holliday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny... Did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down, way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint? Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. The boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? 
Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, he hung up the phone and disappeared. But I saw no man. Are you sure? Well, only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, oh, yes. Yes, he was. Uh... Was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no. He never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? This is Coakley's room. But it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? Dub from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Holiday. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh. Uh -huh. I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight, I'm going dancing. This is a very nice place, Holiday. Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. Like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? You ain't not twins, are you? No, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you know Joe? Yeah, and uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willett. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where are you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into that apartment house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. Mm, this is a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Joe! Oh, it's Holiday. Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here we are. Aren't we? And you replied us, Joe. What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. Can't let him stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willard? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to her? Shut up, you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before? How do, How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only 
One admission. You shut up, I say. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? Suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You have me set up this whole deal. Have me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Have me frame the business of picking up my watch. I time it out perfect for you. What do you do? You go dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Hey, Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. <laughs> This is the last chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy ending. But Johnny Moran's father is free. The district attorney has Grace Willard, Joe Coakley, and the stolen jewelry. And Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped, too, when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this, kid, but uh, did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think you needed money that bad. I uh, needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. Five hundred dollars? Gee, gosh, I guess I'm rich. Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I, I don't know. I... Oh, Mr. Holliday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the house. Oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susie. I just invited Mr. Holliday out to have a drink. He can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Oh, well, gee whiz. Thanks a lot, Susie. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. Next week, same time, Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. The body lay like a squashed melon at the foot of the cliff, period. Uh, period is right. Well, what happens now, Holiday? The inspector wonders how... The inspector wonders... Oh, no, it's Holiday who wonders. I wonder how. I wonder why. I wonder what... I wonder where you've been, Susie. But, Mr. Holliday, I've only been gone ten minutes. Went down to the Star Times after the mail. Oh. Oh, so you did. What's new in Box 13? 
Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is quite a letter. Your ad, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything, reads like a challenge. If it is, I dare you to go to Bay City Pier tonight and do what you will be told when you board the Ruthie J. The Ruthie J. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's the matter, Susie? You wouldn't go on a boat, would you? Oh, well, why not? As a kid, I was a sea scout. Haven't been on a boat since, and I love them. But, Mr. Holliday, what if when you got on that boat, you were shanghaied? Susie, the word is shanghaied. Oh, shanghaied, shanghaied. What's the diff? Suppose some smuggler hits you over the head with a, a sloop or something, and, and... A sloop? Oh, Susie. Yes, a sloop. Uh, and then they sail off and dump you on the beach at Timbuktu. They couldn't sail off and dump me on the beach at Timbuktu. Why not? Timbuktu happens to be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Oh. Yes, oh. And please tie an anchor to that imagination of yours. Okay, Mr. Holliday. But if you wind up on the other side of the world, please don't write me a letter about your voyage. No? No. Just reading about the ocean makes me seasick. Well, Holliday, this is it. Take in a lung full of that fresh ocean breeze. Mmm. Smell that fresh salt air. And fish. Hmm. Not so fresh. Well, the letter said I was to board the Ruthie J. I wonder where she'll be. I wonder what she'll be. A schooner, trim and neat, 42-footer, 12-foot beam. Uh-oh, there's your dream boat. And brother, what a scow. Neat. Hmm. Like a tub of dirty clothes in a mud puddle. Ahoy! Ahoy, mate. Hey, you over there. You calling me, Mac? Yeah. What's with this uh, ahoy mate stuff? You're a seafaring man, aren't you? <laughs> don't let these tight pants fool you. And just because I'm standing on this sea jitney, don't make me no sailor boy. Oh, my mistake. Where's the skipper? The skipper? Hey, look, Mac, I told you I ain't no sailor. With me, you got to talk English. Right, Gunzel. Dip that heater back under your wing and take me to the boss of this fish factory now. Ah, that's better. Now you're talking my language. Can I help you across the rail? Oh, thanks. Say, uh, is your name, uh, Holiday? Yeah, yeah. Dan Holiday? Now, how'd you guess? Pleased to meet you. <laughs> Sweet dreams, Holiday. I hope you enjoy the boat ride. Holiday. Oh, Holiday, you've been sleeping long enough. Better wake up and see what's making your bed roll around like this. Oh, my aching head. Hey, what is this? Don't look now, Holiday, but Susie was right. You've been shanghoed. You're out at sea. Well, and a pretty girl aboard. Hello, Mr. Holliday. I see you're up and around. Yeah, I'm up and my head's going around. <laughs> Bit of a blow, eh, Mr. Holliday? Uh, you mean the one on my skull or the one outside? Oh, I'm sorry about that sapping you took. Sometimes Manny leans a little heavy with that blackjack of his. Hmm. If he'd have leaned any heavier, he'd have driven me right through the deck. Uh, was it you who answered my ad for adventure? Does that surprise you? I uh, wouldn't have associated such a violent reception with a lady. You've embarked upon a real adventure. Uh, well, suppose I decide to sit this one out. You could go ashore. Mm -hmm. Now, which direction is ashore? Immediately astern. Oh, thanks. About 15 miles. Oh, well... In that case, I think I'll stay. Good. I didn't want you to decline my invitation. 
Uh, which explains Manny and his blackjack as a reception committee. Oh. Well, since you're in back of this, uh, just who are you? My name is Marie Gordon. I felt you might be in need of a vacation, Mr. Holiday. Oh, sort of a holiday for holiday. Is that it? Exactly. Well, great. Now, just where do we go on this uh, vacation? You go fishing with the captain. Oh, I go fishing with the captain. What about you, Miss Gordon? I remain locked in my cabin. I have things to think about. What about Manny and his convincers? He didn't sail. Other business kept him ashore. Mm. The uh, plot thickens. I fish with the captain while you stay locked in your cabin and Manny with his blackjack prowls ashore. Correct. And uh, speaking of plots, Mr. Holliday, I've always admired those in your books. Uh, perhaps you could confirm something for me. Mm, I could try. Establish the case of someone having something not his own, wishing to keep it from another person who desires it as well. Where would you put it? Well, in the place you'd least expect to find it, of course. Of course, Mr. Holliday. Good night. Uh, good night, Miss Gordon. Remember, the fish bite early. I know, especially the suckers. <laughs> There's a strong odor aboard this ship, and it isn't just fish. But there's nothing you can do tonight, Holiday, so you might as well get some sleep. Oh, a sailor's life is the very best life, so it's a sailor's life for me. A sailor's oh, morning. life for... You're the captain? Yep. Morning, ship. Come through last night's squall okay? Uh, yeah, except for this bump on my noggin. Roll to get his tension, eh? Twelve a bit rough. Rough is right. Oh, um, I understand you and I are going to do some fishing. Aye, sir. These grounds is good for swordfish. Might even catch us a marlin. Uh, just where are we, Captain? Them islands way off there is the Catalinas. Plenty of albacore here, too. Doesn't Miss Gordon like to fish? Don't know, sir. This is the first time she's hired me in the Ruthie J. Then this isn't Miss Gordon's boat. Nope. She's mine. We're just chartered for this trip. How long are we provisioned for? Four or five days. Could put in at Avalon if you want to stay out longer. I didn't want to stay out this long. Not ready to go ashore so soon, are you, Mr. Holliday? A few days fishing is just what you need. What I need is to have my head examined. That bump still bothering you? No, but what might be happening back in town is... Relax, Mr. Holliday. Everything will be taken care of. Yeah? Yeah. But I'm wondering how... And what and why? Why is right. Just why would a girl like Marie Gordon maroon you on a fishing boat? What's the gag? And how is it going to be pulled and on whom? Holiday is an author. You're not even a good fisherman. You're quite a fisherman, Mr. Holiday. Why, in just four days, you handle that heavy gear like a real deep sea man. Thanks. But don't you think we've got enough fish? You've got another. There goes your line off the outrigging. It's a big one. Let him run, sir. Now, hit him hard. Good. You've got him, sir. Don't look now, but but I think he's got me. He's a marlin, I think. Let him play. Well, let him go play with someone else. I'm tired. Oh, that's, that's too bad, Mr. Holiday. You set your drag too soon. That's why he broke the gear. I wanted to break the gear. I'm sick of fishing. Captain, I want to be put ashore now. Sorry, sir. Miss Gordon will have to give me new orders. Now, look, Captain, I'm going ashore. I'm going to be there before tonight. But, but Mr. Holliday... Captain, I... you heard the gentleman. He's going ashore. Aye, right, ma'am. Do we run for the mainland or the islands? Neither. We stay here. But you said Mr. Holliday was to go ashore. That's correct. Lower the dinghy, Captain. The dinghy? And hand Mr. Holliday the oars. The oars? Ma'am, we're more than ten miles off Catalina. If Mr. Holliday wishes to be ashore before tonight, he'd better start rowing now. Oh, you beautiful Box 13. If it hadn't have been for you, I wouldn't be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a rowboat. You better rest on your oars a minute, Holiday. 
Because the wind is coming up, the bump on your head is swelling, the ache in your back is growing, and the blisters on your hands are spreading. Oh, when Susie mentioned the beach at Timbuktu, she knew what she was talking about. There's no ocean there. Hey, uh, Spaulding. You're looking for me? Oh. Oh, there you are, Manny. Yes, yes, I've been looking for you. Now, what does the great Edward B. Spaulding want with Quiet. me? Quiet. Quiet, will you? You should know better than to mention me by name. Get in that booth. Ah. <laughs> None of your penthouse-type clientele would be in a joint like this. Have a seat, Spaulding. I tell you, that doesn't matter. I, I just shouldn't be seen even talking. In that case, hit the road. I got to keep my rep, too. Meaning what? I'm a nice, honest hood. And even though you act and look like the owner of Tiffany's, to me, you're just a fence. Where's your boss, Marie? She's out fishing. Fishing? She couldn't be. Look, pretty boy. If her and this holiday want to go on a fishing trip, it's their business, see? It's my business to get what I've paid for. The last shipment's overdue. Now, where is it? <laughs> you're sounding kind of tough for you. With the amount of money this deal involves, I can get tougher. Well, I don't know from nothing. You gotta talk to her. If Marie's trying to pull something... Hey, wait a minute. You mentioned a holiday. That wouldn't be Dan Holiday. Did I say, uh, holiday? Thought I said, uh, Hallahan. <laughs> or was it Halloween? All right, Manny, be a comedian. But tell your boss if she doesn't produce that merchandise by tomorrow, there'll be trouble. Ha, ha. If I told her, she might die of fright. If she doesn't come through, somebody is going to die. And it won't be from fright. Well, Holiday, you finally made it. You were towed into Catalina, hocked your watch for a ticket, and flew right back to town. If this is adventure, you'd better stick with the more dangerous sports like croquet or something. <laughs> Susie. Oh, I forgot about Susie. She'll wonder what's happened. I'm four days late for lunch. She's not here. I guess she got hungry. She's not here, Holiday, but I am. Yeah, who are you? Get in that office. All right. All right. All right, now what's this all about? I want to know where you've been for four days. I, uh... I don't think I've had the pleasure. It may not prove to be a pleasure, if what I suspect is true. Now, where's Marie Gordon? Marie Gordon? From your expression of surprise, I gather you know what I'm talking about. Did you catch any fish, or was it larger game you were after? Not knowing who you are, I'm at a disadvantage. Disadvantage is even greater now. Now, do you talk, or do I shoot? Oh, do I have a choice? No. In that case, I'll talk. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd. As Dan Holiday. Holiday, you can run into more trouble than a kid playing football with a beehive. You know, I don't think this guy's in the mood to believe you just got popped on the bean and taken for a boat ride. He thinks you're in on the deal. Yeah, but what's the deal? Come on, Holiday, talk. Oh, I'd love to, but what do we talk about? About five minutes. And if by then you haven't told me where you and Marie have been instead of fishing, I'm going to pull this trigger. Now, believe me. I caught five tuna, ten albacore, four swordfish, and a pair of blistered hands. And that's no fish story. Hey, where are you going? Over here to turn up your radio. You see, I'm very considerate of others. This is a very big gun, makes a very big noise. I don't want to disturb the neighbors when it goes off. Okay, mister, whatever your name is. 
I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. And if you don't believe me, you can start shooting. You sound very brave, Holiday. And I act very dumb. Now, I know it was stupid of me to accept a blind invitation to visit a boat named the Ruthie J. Because when I got there, a tough character in tight pants used my head for a dinner gong. Somebody slugged you? Yeah. And I've got the bump to prove it. This character's name wouldn't begin with the letter M. As far as I'm concerned, it ended with A-N-N-Y. So it was Manny. Well, go on. Well, while I was unconscious, I was tucked Betty by in the cabin of the boat. And when I woke up, I was gazing into the lovely blue eyes of one Miss Marie Gordon, a woman I have never seen before in my life. Then I suppose you and this total stranger went fishing for four days. Now you took the words right out of my mouth. Well, find some more. And tell me you didn't ask any questions. That you were just brought back home with salt spray in your hair, a beautiful tan, and nothing else. I asked plenty of questions. To which I got plenty of no answers. And for your information, I wasn't brought back home. Oh? You, uh, swam? No, I rode. Ten miles all the way to Catalina. There I caught a plane, took a cab from the airport, and found you here waiting for me. That, brother, is my story. You, uh... Turned off the radio. What's the trouble? No gunplay? No gunplay. Uh, great, but why the change of heart? Holiday, I understand you're quite an author. But even you couldn't make up a story like that one. So, Holiday, you got rid of the mysterious man with a gun. Hey, but what about Susie? She's not here, she's not at home. The start times. They'll know what happened to her. Well, if it isn't Dan Holiday, have a nice vacation. Oh, wonderful, Jonesy. Hey, have you seen Susie? Not since the other morning. She came in with a wire telling her to take a few days' vacation. Hey, who told her to take a vacation? Well, you did, of course. Don't you remember? Jonesy, sometimes my left hand just doesn't know what my right hand is writing. Where'd she go? She didn't say. She came in with a man wearing tight pants. She looked for the mail. There wasn't any, and they went away. Man with the tight pants. Manny, I'll see you later. Now, now, wait. All this mail came while you've been gone. And a box, too. Here. A box? Hmm, what could this be? Maybe candy. Oh, nobody loves me that much. Wait. What? You hear something tick in that box right now? T tick? You think it's... I think you better get that thing out of here. Oh, but Jonesy, Take I... Take it to police headquarters. Get it out of the building fast. It might blow up any minute. <laughs> You've ridden in many a taxi cab holiday, but this is the first one you've taken with a maniac in the driver's seat and a bomb in the back. Inspector Blake, that's my man. You say this thing, Dick? Yeah, it sounds like a clock in there. Well, come on, hurry. Where are we going? We've got a bomb shelter down in the basement. Oh, that's great, but why take the bomb with us? We're going to open that box. That's all I need. Been soaking for 30 minutes. We're safe now. Whew. Thanks, Inspector. Say, do you mind shoving my heart back into place for me? Now, there's nothing to worry about, my boy. We'll open up this beauty and see what we've got. Holy smoke. These are jewels, Holiday. Now, what made you think this was a time bomb? I have an aversion to anything that ticks. And I have an aversion, too. To people like you who come in here talking about time bombs when all they've heard are some loose jewels clicking together. Well, I'm sorry, Inspector. Well, uh, I think I'll beat it just... Just let me wrap up those stones. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Those jewels stay here until you can prove ownership. Now, where'd you get them? To whom do they belong? Give me about 30 minutes, Inspector, and I think I'll be able to answer you. So that's what it was, Holiday. A stunt to smuggle jewels. Into box 13, no less. That Marie Gordon, she's a clever, clever girl. No wonder the mysterious character at the office was waving that gun at me. Oh, think of what would have happened if I'd tried to lie to him. Come on, Holiday, you've got places to go and some people to meet. I was sure worried about you rowing all that way, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that's okay, Captain. Hey, uh, what I came here for was to locate Miss uh, Gordon. Do you know where I can find her? She's a popular woman. Two other men come a-looking for her. 
Two men? Yep. One was a smooth-looking sort of fella. The other was a tough. With tight pants? That you mention it? Yes. He was here when we docked. Uh, what happened? Did you hear the conversation? Only that the tough one was to go right quick to a place called Rambler's Inn and wait. Uh, then the other man arrived? Yep. He seemed sore about something. They got in a car together and drove off. That's the last I see them. Captain, you're terrific. When my blistered hands heal up, you and I are going back after the mile and it got away. All right, Matt. Where do you think you're drawn? Well, well, if it ain't Mr. Holiday again. Only this time, I don't think you were invited. Yeah, that's right. And this time, you're the one who's going Betty by. You go. Pleasant dreams, Manny. Yeah. Just in case you get restless in your sleep, let me tie in bed with this bailing wire. I didn't have time to ask you in which cabin there were, Manny. But those angry voices I hear down the line, I don't think they would be coming from honeymooners. Three for the last time, where are those jewels? Don't threaten me, Spaulding. Manny's right outside. One call from me and he'd be all over you like a rug. I gave you the money to pay off the smugglers. I want the jewels. At first, the boys didn't want to turn over the stuff. When they finally did, I thought they might try to get it back. So you went off on a fishing trip with a man named Holiday. Why? Certainly. And for a good reason. Holiday has the jewelry. What? How did he get into this? You know about his ad in the Star Times? What about it? When I thought we might have trouble with the boys, I had to think of a place to put it where they wouldn't expect to find it. So? I sent it to Box 13. <laughs> Where are you going? To pay another visit to Dan Holiday. Don't bother. What? I'm here. Holiday! Manny! Manny! I'm afraid Manny won't hear you. What? He's taking his nap. And you look sleepy, too. What? Say, Manny's blackjack works fine. Your friend Spaulding is sleeping like an infant. Now. Now. What? Now, what's this about my having that smuggled jewelry? You, uh, could share in it with me. Mm -hmm. You're very generous. I can afford to be. Duty-free and with Spaulding's wealthy clients. Oh. You decided to cut Spaulding in after all. Why should I? What do you mean? I'd rather cut you in, Mr. Holliday. No, thanks. I'm not interested. But that's foolish. Think of all that money. I am, but I'm also thinking of a great tag for the yarn I'm going to write. But what will that get you? Royalties, lady. Royalties. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Holiday, prepare yourself for an I told you so from Susie when she comes in. <laughs> Brother, wait till she finds out she was right about those smugglers and my being shang -hoed. Holiday. Uh, what is it, Inspector? Uh, we've been after that smuggling gang for a long time. If that Gordon dame hadn't gotten so greedy and tried to chisel on Spaulding, we wouldn't have caught up with him so soon. And, of course, uh, you helped a bit, too. Uh, coming from a police inspector, those are very kind words. Well, Susie, it's about time you showed up. Oh, hello, Mr. Holliday. My, what a beautiful tan. Catch any fish? All kinds. Tell me, Susie, where have you been? Out of town. The wire you sent me said to take a vacation for five or six days. Oh, the wire I sent, which I didn't send. Well, anyway, you didn't specify which, so, Mr. Holliday, I took six. I see. And Mr. Holliday. Yes, Susie? Y you know the nice man that I went down to Box 13 with? Yes. Well, I told him how I warned you about t being taken by smugglers, and do you know what he said? No. What did he say? He said you were right about the smugglers. They wouldn't hit you on the head with the sloop. They'd use a blackjack. Oh, fine. 
Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger with original story by Frank Hart Tausig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. He looked deeply into... Her eyes, which reflected his mood like twin lakes of azure blue. Azure blue. Why does a woman always have to have azure eyes? Why couldn't they be fire engine red? Huh. As his muscular arms tightened around her fragile... Susie. Oh, Mr. Holliday, I'm not fragile, but I'm sure scared. Somebody's been following me. With those legs? Why not? I, I was petrified, afraid to look back even. His footsteps kept going click, cluck, click, cluck. Real sinister like. Oh, I bet that's him now. Mr. Click, cluck. Oh, Mr. Holiday, he followed me all the way from box 13. <laughs> And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is a brand new twist. Besides a message from Box 13, Susie has brought a mysterious caller. Somebody who wants in, but definitely. Don't answer it, Mr. Holliday. Now, now, Susie. You didn't see this person, huh? No, I, I just felt him following me like a, uh, like a phantom. Except his heels went click, cluck, click, cluck. Oh. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Let's take a chance. Come in. Oh. <laughs> Silly me. I ought to be ashamed for being such a fraidy cat. Look who it is. Well, Susie, who is it? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is George Flitt. I'm a, a detective. And you're Dan Holliday, the writer. It's, it's on the door. A detective, huh? <laughs> Why, well, isn't any bigger than me. But I have nerves of steel and the heart of a lion. Oh, oh, I see. And what brings you here, Mr. Flitt? Well, who? Ah! Nerves of steel. Heart of a lion. <laughs> that was no fair, girlie. You took me by surprise. Susie. Now, Mr. Flitt. Why don't you open the envelope I put in box 13? Here it is, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Open it. I'm all goose lumps. Okay. Well, what do you know? Why, there's nothing written on the paper. Hmm. How about that, Flit? See how clever I am? I put that envelope in box 13 as bait. As bait? Yes, I knew it would lead me to the person who put the ad in the Star Times. Adventure Wanted will go any place and do anything. Very clever, Mr. Flit. Oh, what made your footsteps go click, cluck, click, cluck? <laughs> All of that. I lost the metal cleat off of one of my heels. Oh. Well, now that you've discovered me, Mr. Flit, what? Mr. Holliday, I'd say you're just the man for the job. Job? Something exciting, you hope, huh, Mr. Holliday? I'd handle it myself, only I'm so tiny. Besides, I've done mostly divorce work. 
just the right height for keyholes. But uh, about the job. Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Bolton sent me $50 just to attend the party tonight. $50? I should have been the detective. Oh, you can be. I'll split with you if you'll go to the affair in my place as me. You got the money. What's the catch? Oh, there's really no catch. Uh, only thing Mr. Bolton said was there might be a little uh, bloodshed. <laughs> Well, 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 this holiday is the wackiest situation yet from good old Box 13. Yes, holiday, you must be hard up for story ideas. Hard up for brains, too. Otherwise, why are you riding with George Flitt, detective, in his hot rod jalopy? Destination, bloodshed. And you've never met this Bolton who's having the party. No, but he phoned and explained that the party is going to be at his nephew's place, uh, Kenneth Bolton. Kenneth, huh? Uh, what about the bloodshed? Well, as I understand it, Kenneth's father, that is, uh, Gilbert Bolton's brother, committed suicide not so long ago. Oh. Gilbert said the boy is suffering from neurasthenia, I, I think he said. Psychoneurotic, huh? Uh, yes, on account of the way his father died. Uh, Gilbert's afraid the boy may take his own life tonight. Why tonight, especially? Well, it seems that Kenneth drinks a lot at these parties and gets depressed. And my job is... To see that he doesn't commit suicide tonight. I've looked forward to more pleasant evenings. I, I think that's the place up ahead with all the lights on. Yeah, that's the address you mentioned. Hmm, we must be about 15 miles from town. Uh, 14 and 7 tenths by my speedometer. Well, Flit, I may as well take off. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll sit here in my car and listen to the radio, sort of keep my eye on things from the outside. Good idea. See you later, then. Here we go again, Holiday. Oops, the name's George Flit, detective. Remember? Beyond this door, who knows? But it's a beautiful house, a beautiful night. And a beautiful girl. Good evening. Oh, good evening. I'm looking for Mr. Gilbert Bolton. You want to come in? And you are? Uh, George Flitt. You say you are George Flitt? That's right. I'm Rita Martin. How do you do? Now let's go in and find Gilbert Bolton, Mr. Flitt. <laughs> Oh, holiday, here's a jungle cat. A vampire right of Terry and the pirates. That jet black hair, those heavy lidded eyes. That glistening crimson mouth. And something else. Yes, heavy, cloying, sensuous. A perfume such as you've never known before. That's something to remember this Rita Martin by. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, there you are. Oh, Gilbert. Yes, Rita. Gilbert Bolton, this is George Flitt. George, how do you do, Mr. Flitt? Mr. Bolton? If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll see you all a bit later. So, you're George Flitt, the detective. Yes, that's right. Your voice seemed, well, different over the phone. Well, you know, detectives, many disguises, many voices. <laughs> Got to keep them confused, you know. Somehow I pictured you differently. Oh? Well, no matter. You know why you're here. Yes, to keep my eye on your nephew, Kenneth Bolton. More than that, to keep him from chilling himself. The way this man looks at you, Holiday. So cool, so calculating. With piercing eyes that thud against the back of your skull. He could be one of two men. A man of distinction or a man of extinction. Okay, Mr. Bolton, I'll keep your nephew alive. That's your job. But what makes you think the boy wants to commit suicide? Well, since his father, my brother, took his life, Kenneth has been extremely upset. It's only natural, Mr. Bolton. I know, but I've heard Kenneth threaten suicide, and it's got me worried. Anyone else heard him? Yes, Miss Martin. Uh, anyone else? What do you mean, anyone else? I just wondered if anyone else had heard him make these threats. I really wouldn't know. It's enough that Rita and I know about it. 
How does Rita figure in this picture? Aren't you being a bit presumptuous, Mr. Flitt? A detective likes to know these things. Yes. Miss Martin is an old friend of the family. Oh, there's Kenneth now. I'll bring him over. Just as Gilbert Bolton passed me, there was something familiar about him. What was it? Who was it? Come on, think, Holiday. It may be an important clue. But here they come. The man of extinction and a typical boy from Princeton or Yale or Harvard. George Flitt, my nephew, Kenneth Bolton. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Enjoying yourself, Mr. Flitt? Very much. How about you? Oh, so-so. These parties get to be a bore, you know. Kenneth hasn't been quite himself since the tragedy. Must you always bring that up, Uncle? But you know you've been terribly upset, Kenneth. So I've been upset. Why talk about it? Oh, Mr. Flitt. Yes? Will you come with me for a moment? Oh, I sure. It's so close in here that I thought a breath of air. That suits me. In the garden. The garden it is. Hmm. Nice. A moon, too. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely night. Ah, the scent of those flowers. Exquisite, isn't it? Uh-huh. But not to compare with your perfume. You noticed it. Yes, it was so unusual. It's called Whispering Gown. Whispering Gown? Mm, I like the name. Say. Yes? Yeah? I know where they got that name. Oh? From Cerno de Bergerac. The passage where he describes Roxanne. Across my life, one whispering silken gown. That was lovely. You're quite literary, aren't you, Mr. Flitt? Well, yes no. Just what do you do? Gilbert Bolton didn't tell you. No. No, but let's sit on this bench and you tell me all about yourself. As you come close to her, you get another whiff of... And suddenly you've got it. That's what bothers you about Gilbert Bolton. Her perfume rubbed off on him. It is an old friend of the family. She's young and a close friend of Gilbert Bolton's. She's brought you out here for a reason. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I sure, but uh, just a minute. I want to borrow some cigarettes. I've got plenty of cigarettes. Uh, I'll be right back. Something about this whole setup is as phony as a china egg. And as the crooks in your story say, better case a joint before you go inside. There. There's a window. Just pull the bushes back. Let's take a gander. Well, everything looks on the up and up. Kenneth with a drink on the table beside him, and there's his uncle coming up. Hmm. He set another full drink right beside Kenneth. Hey, what else is he doing? You'd better get in there, Holiday, and fast. <laughs> Mind if I, I join you, gentlemen? Well, not at all, not at all. You appeared quite uh, suddenly. Care for a drink, Mr. Flitt? Here, I haven't touched this one. No, no, let me fix Mr. Flitt a fresh drink. I think I'll just have one of these hors d'oeuvres. Here, watch it, my drink. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Flitt, you, you awkward idiot. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Uncle. Accidents will happen. I didn't really feel like another drink. It was your idea, remember? Well, Mr. Flett, were you able to borrow some cigarettes? I was ambushed by hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> Glad you're here, Rita. I have a proposal to make. Yes? What say we all run up to my penthouse for a while? Oh, sounds good. What do you say, Mr. Flett? Fine. I think a change of scenery would be nice. You'll enjoy the view overlooking Green Hill Park from the penthouse, Mr. Flett. Oh, good. What's the address? i uh, tell you what, Mr. Flitt. Rita, Kenneth, and myself will go ahead in my car. Then you can follow us in yours. Well, maybe I'd better go with Mr. Flitt. To keep him company. No, I'd like you with me, Kenneth. There's something I uh, want to discuss with you. Important. Well, per perhaps I should have the address in case I lose you. you that know, but... won't be necessary. Uh, just follow me. Of course, Holiday, you... Could be wrong, but it looks like Gilbert Bolton isn't too anxious to have you find his penthouse. Ah, but you're a suspicious lad, Holiday. You've created so many diabolical characters for so many fiendish plots. Maybe you, maybe you've become a little touched. The times are wasting, Holiday. Get to a phone. Huh? There it is, end of the hallway. Now, if Max on duty in the morgue of the Star Times, we'll ask a few questions. 
Star Times reference room. Hello, Mac. This is Dan Holliday. Ah, oh, Danny. What can I do you for? Say, so you got anything on the Bolton suicide? Just filed those clips away yesterday. And even if this is a clips joint, I won't charge you a penny. <laughs> clips joint. You get it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I get it. But what about Bolton? Poisoned himself. Left all his dough to his son. Name of Kenneth. Anything else? Well, there was something about Bolton's brother, uh, Gilbert. He sort of taken over and helping the boy. Kid was pretty broke up. Hey, Dan. Hey, did you hang up? No, but someone did. Someone was listening on another extension. Hey, this is the fastest hot rod I've ever driven. We're keeping right up with a Bolton. And he's doing 70. <laughs> Wait until you shift into high gear. Where are we going? To a penthouse, I hope. Gilbert Bolton's. Hmm. Uh, what happened at the party? Oh, Rita Martin tried to get me into the garden and... I got suspicious. Trying to keep you away from your job, wasn't she? Yeah, so I rushed back into the house, stopping to case the joint through a window. Case the joint? <laughs> a detective talk. Yeah, then I got into trouble with Bolton. Well, how? By knocking a drink from his nephew's hand. Huh? Uh, what did the uncle do? He got insulting. Then all of a sudden, he suggested going to his pet house. Watch it, watch it. He, he's slowing down. Yeah, I wonder what his idea is. Oh, he's just slowing down with that train. But he only slowed down for a second. Look at him go. I know what he's doing. He's trying to beat that train to the crossing. He's trying to lose us. Step on the gas. Step on the gas, Mr. Holliday. Okay. Mr. Holliday, are we going to make it? He made it, but I don't know about us. You are listening to Box... 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Next time I want such a close shave, I'll see my barber. Yeah, me too. Gosh, Mr. Holliday, I thought I could handle this hot rod. But the way you whipped her off the road just short of those tracks, I... Mm, not a scratch on her. Lucky us. Oh, that train must be a mile long. Mm, by the time it passes, Bolton can be in Alaska. What's the address of his penthouse? You're asking me. All I know is that overlooks Green Hill Park. Our next stop... <laughs> Well, George, Green Hill Park. <laughs> I bet all these buildings have penthouses. We'll try them all until we hit the right one. I'll go around this side of the park. Okay, and I'll try the buildings around the other side. Bolton's got to be in one. Do you have a Mr. Bolton in your penthouse? No one here by that name. A Bolton in the penthouse? No, but uh, we have a Botsford in the basement. Why, yes, Mr. Gilbert Bolton came in a short time ago. Hello? No, with a lady and gentleman. Want to go up? Oh, please. Did Mr. Bolton say anything about expecting more guests? No, sir. Do me a favor. If a little fellow with a squeaky voice shows up asking for Bolton, tell him I'm here, will you? Dan Holliday. Yes, sir. Oh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Your floor, sir. Uh, that's the penthouse door over there. Right. I've got a sneaking hunch I won't be welcome. Flip, how did you get up here? You, uh, you didn't expect me? Oh, yes, yes, of course, but uh, you've earned your money. You can, well, you can go home now. I'm sorry, Miss Martin, but Mr. Bolton hired me. It's up to him to fire me. But he's not here. He and Kenneth both went out. May I come in and wait? No. Goodbye. Now what? Now what does the intrepid hero of my stories do? Hmm. He looks for another door. 
like that one. He tries it. It's open. Leads into a hallway. And there's yet another door. The servant's entrance to Bolton's penthouse. And ten to one, it's locked, bolted, and barred. Maybe even nailed shut. You're some gambler, Holiday. Offer ten to one and lose. The door's open. Well, here we go again. Shh. Quiet, Holiday. Ah, oh, there's a door leading to the terrace and voices. Really an excellent view here. I'll get your ear up, Holiday. But don't let them see you. Don't you think it's a little chilly out here, Uncle? Let's go inside. Chilly, Kenneth? I'm really very comfortable. Here's the view I was telling you about, Kenneth. Better lean over the rail a bit to see around that turret. Well, don't push against me, Uncle. That's a ten-story drop. Now, look over there, Kenneth. Uncle Gill! <laughs> Kenneth, let's get away from that rail! Don't flinch you. Don't have to throw me back. Better than having your uncle throw you forward. What's the meaning of this outrage? How did you get in here anyway? I'm going to call the police. Fine, and save me the trouble. Look, Kenneth, I was hired to keep you from committing suicide. Suicide? Who, me? Yeah, but instead I'm keeping you from being murdered. Feel in your coat pocket. Ignore him, Kenneth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. A bottle? It's marked poison. Yeah, I saw your uncle plant it in your pocket through the garden window. He wanted to make it look like you poisoned that drink I knocked from your hand. Stop right there, Holiday. This isn't a cap pistol. You too, Kenneth. Don't move. Well, you must be crazy, Uncle Gill. And you knew I was Dan Holiday all along, huh? Of course. I've seen your picture in the book review pages. And I caught you a telephone conversation at the Star Times. On the extension. You get around. I can't believe this. You, you, my uncle. What's the play now, Bolton? Well, first I walk over to Kenneth and knock him out with his gun. No, don't move, Holiday. I've still got you covered. Oh? And now that you've knocked out your nephew, what's your next move? Mr. Holiday, before I heave him over the rail to make it look like suicide... I'm going to shoot you. Oh, fine. Then I'll wipe my fingerprints off this gun and press my nephew's hand around the butt. Hmm. His fingerprints on the gun will prove he shot me, huh? But what about a motive? Very simple. You tried to stop him from jumping off the terrace. And you're supposed to invent plots, Mr. Holliday. But they'll trace the gun to you, Bolton. Oh, no. It's Kenneth's gun. I took it from his room. And you wanted a detective on hand to throw off suspicion? Yes, Mr. Holliday. Who'd suspect Gilbert of murder when he'd hired a detective to protect Kenneth? But why? Why do you want to kill your nephew? Let's say I borrowed quite a large sum I can't make good. Oh. Embezzlement, huh? And you need Kenneth's inheritance to keep out of jail. Wouldn't he lend you the money? Not the amount we need. We? Obviously. So, we're uh, taking it all. Clever, eh, Holiday? You're killing me. You're so right. Get rid of whoever it is, Rita. If that isn't help, Holiday, forget about writing the great American novel. No room in a coffin for typing. I tell you, you really can't. Yeah, I've got to go in and see. I know. I say you can't come in. I tell you, I've got to go I know Dan Holliday's in here and nobody's Never mind, Rita. I couldn't stop him. I've got plenty of bullets. Welcome to the party, George. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Ah, a gun. Let me out of here. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Ah! Watch out. Thanks for the distraction. Flip. Now, Mr. Gilbert Bolton, you know how your nephew feels. Well, I know how it feels to be on the right end of this Smith & Wesson. You knocked him out. What are you going to do? Do? Well, since the party's getting dull, let's invite a few more boys. Say, from headquarters. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday.
Come in. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Hello, Susie. Ah, Mr. George Flitt, detective. How's the arm, Mr. Flitt? Oh, it's uh, healing up fine. One of the bullets just grazed me. You know, I bled quite a lot. Say, wasn't that awful, them trying to kill that boy? And he really wasn't psycho whatchamacallit at all. Uh, Bolton cooked that up to support the suicide story. Oh. What's going to happen to them, Mr. Holliday? Well, they've got Bolton for embezzlement and attempted murder. They're holding Rita as his accomplice. And she was such a beautiful girl and so sweet, too. Yes, George, you can say that again. H how's the rod hot these days, Mr. Flitt? Hot rod, Susie. Hot rod, rod hot, red hot. Oh, how is it anyway? Red hot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's fine. And Mr. Holliday, mm? even if I did run away from that gun, I really do have the heart of a lion. But of course, George. Only thing is, <laughs> it's a scaredy cat lion. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager, with an original story by Larry Kraft. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in box 13? <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now, let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything, what I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridal path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. Uh, 
an anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was riding. At least it's got a good start. The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep, nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman came when I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. But aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. Oh, I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Jamie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? Oh, I've got two homes. I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie, flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right. And go two blocks. <sighs> That's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now stop that, Janie, and tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only oh, they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Here, let me see uh -huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. You're nice. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker if there ever was one. Well, this is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. 
down on the couch, Holiday. Hmm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holiday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? She's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I'm on a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holliday, keep it just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You'll just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. You'll understand soon, Mr. Holliday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're right, writer, Holiday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. <laughs> Janie. I broke the nail. I broke the nail. <gasps> no. Oh, that's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my bed to book. No, don't cry, honey. <laughs> That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. Are you a night man? Are you my daddy? No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Hmm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Teddy bear? No teddy bear. You must be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? Tell me a fairy story. All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears... The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the, the ba baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, now I say, once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red Riding Hood. And, and the, the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed. And it grew up into a mighty tall vine. And, and he, he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Whew. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. When you stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. <laughs> well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Holiday. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky, uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it doesn't. It isn't? <laughs> uh, holiday. Great little kid, her dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> All children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. The writing business slow these days, Holiday? How do you mean? I oh, thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, 
Oh, yes, just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends. Uh, are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Whew. Your hands are shaking. Never mind, Jane. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off, you'll wake the kid. You Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old. Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can I use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Uh, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. He comes with me, Holiday. Let's keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holiday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holliday, I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holliday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? A man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man... Did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. no it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Holliday, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must be seated. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? With your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you could remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. 
He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I dropped here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. Then where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They've gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's Mr. mother... Mr. Holiday, there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark. What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here. But I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. You'll get her. You'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. There. There it is. Brown's Motel. This is one time you'd better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He he said he didn't want to be disturbed. This is a matter of life and death. Get into the phone. Uh, Who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, quick, Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course I do, Daddy. And tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. Mommy! I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holliday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Janie. Mommy! Janie. No, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holliday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holliday. Thanks. 
Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Cling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Cling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child, who did? A man named Sam Parker, who turned out to be Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her a child, a holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer that all, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. Hey, that's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Mr. Holliday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holliday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can see my two mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. And would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holliday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holliday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh, boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, care of the Star Times. Carl! Carl! What are you doing? Nothing. I ain't doing nothing. It's just a book, Holiday. Somebody sent a book to Box 13. Why?
And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Susie. Susie, come here a minute, will you? Did you call me Mr. Holliday? How did you guess? I heard you. All right. Now that we've cleared that up, how about this book? That one? This one. It came in the mail for Box 13. You sure? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Holliday. The wrapping paper's right in the wastebasket there. I- I'll get it and show you. Here. Address printed. Block letters. Shaky hand. Susie, did any letter come with this? Mm, just the book. Ex Libris. Robert and Chase. All right, Susie, we've got a problem. Somebody sends me a book from the library of Robert N. Chase. Why? Maybe it's a bestseller. Yeah, and its day it was. Still is. The poems of Sir Walter Scott. Do you like poetry, Mr. Holliday? Love it, Susie. Just love it. Listen. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it by the pale moonlight. The gay beams of light some day gild but to flout the ruins gray. Pretty, huh? What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? Susie, you're asking the jackpot question. The book's broken to fall open at this poem. Why? We're in a rut. Well, there's one way to get out of it. If anyone calls for me, I'll be in the morgue. Star time. <laughs> Sure, sure. Robert N. Chase. We've got plenty about him, Holiday. Well, let me have it. You ought to remember him. Vaguely, I do. All right, Mac, what do we got? Headlines. Lots of them. Headlines, huh? What's he been doing? Same thing he's been doing for the past ten years. He's in a rut, too. Six foot deep. Dead? Here. You read all about it, Dan. Socialites dead in tragic blaze. Oh, sure, I remember now. But ten, ten years ago, I was cutting my reporter's teeth on a police beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cop wouldn't get a juicy story like this to cover. Son near death. Daughter at school escapes tragedy. Last night, fire swept the Robert M. Chase mansion. Blaze unnoticed until too late, spread rapidly. Injured son not expected to live. He did, though. Uh-huh, I see. Mildred Chase, 18, was attending a college function when the flames took the lives of her parents and swept rapidly through the palatial country estate, Fair Melrose. They were... Fair Melrose? Yeah, that was the name of the estate. Fair Melrose. Mac, the uh, Chase girl, got anything on her? What paper didn't have? What do you mean? You know, too much dough, spoiled kid, wrong company. She ran smack into the gossip stuff almost every week. Know where she is now? Well, she dropped back after the fire. It kind of cooled her off. Mm, she's been a good girl ever since, is that it? Well, that's it. I tell you what, Dan, drop upstairs to see more in society. She can give you the dope. All right. Thanks, Mac. Say, you must come and visit my morgue sometime. Uh, I like this one. I only read about characters. I don't have to bump into them. Ah, but mine move around, Mac, and sometimes too fast. <laughs> Oui, monsieur. Ah, free French are engaged. You wish to see someone, monsieur? Yes, Miss Chase. Miss Mildred Chase. You have an appointment? Is that an offer or a business question? <laughs> monsieur, if you will tell me... Well, yes, what is it? There is someone here, mademoiselle. I don't wish to be disturbed. I'm sorry, monsieur. But mademoiselle Chase, she is not home. Oh, I see. Then you've got a talking piano. <laughs> oh, please, monsieur. I cannot let you in. You are mademoiselle. Yes, I did. But if you will go in and tell Mademoiselle that Sir Walter Scott is waiting to see her, I'm sure she'll listen. What do you say? Where? Vive la France. <laughs> All right. You wait here. But I cannot promise. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Chase. I, I have to see you. Well, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Well, lots of people haven't. But my name's Dan Holliday. The name means nothing to me. It means everything to my mother. <laughs> what do you want? I'm sorry, Miss Chase, bursting in like this. But I've come to see you about Fair Melrose. Who... who are you? 
Oh, I told you. Dan Holliday. Occupation, fiction writer. And are you writing now, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Oh, uh, is this yours? Mine? That book? Here, take it. Where did you get this? You don't know. No. Where did you get it? But you do recognize it. Yes. It, it was part of my father's collection. I asked you, how did you get it? Through the mail. It was addressed to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Or doesn't that mean anything? No. Nothing at all. You should read the classified ads, Miss Chase. Box 13. Adventure wanted will go anywhere, do anything. Well, you thank see, I... you for bringing the book back to me, Mr. Holliday. You don't have any idea why the book was sent to me? Oh, I, I don't know any more about it than you do. Maybe you don't. That's right. Colette will show you Was there anything now. suspicious about the fire that destroyed Fair Melrose? Mr. Holliday, I don't know what you have in mind, but that was a cruel thing to say. A hateful thing. You're not proud of it, are you? I'm nothing one way or the other, Miss Chase. But that book was sent to me. It was broken to fall open at the poems about Fair Melrose. I'd just like to know why. I know nothing about it. All I know is that fire took my mother and father. It's very sad, Miss Chase. And my poor brother was left a hopeless invalid, completely paralyzed, unable to speak, to move. Where is your brother now? At Fair Melrose. The place he always loved. But I thought it was destroyed by fire ten years ago. Yes. But one wing remained standing. Your brother is there alone? Yes. That's where he would want to be. And I arranged for someone to care for him. Oh, I see. And now, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to forget all this. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you, Miss Chase. I was merely curious about that book. I know nothing about it. All I want to do is to forget. To forget! <laughs> What you want this hour of the night? I'm looking for Fair Melrose. Eh? What for? Will you tell me how I can get there? I'm lost. Stay lost, then. Just a minute, please. Get your foot out of the door. Get! Don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to know the way to Fair Melrose. Eh, what for? I've, I've got business there. You're lying. Nobody's got no business there. Nobody. All right, I'm nobody. Is your house on the ground? Yeah, it should be. Been here for 30 years. Oh, Nice little cottage you've got here. What do you want to go up there for? To look at it. Huh? What for? Huh. Nice waltz we're having. Young fella, I asked you a question, and you ain't answered. All right. I want to find out about the fire. Well, hmm. ain't nothing nobody needs to find out about it. It was a visitation of the Lord. It was a judgment on the sin that was going on. Heaven rained fire that night and wiped out the last of Babylon. I'm not sure I got all that. Oh, the wages of sin is death. Now you know. Wait a minute. Were you here that night? Me and Carl. Carl? Eh, my husband. He was down here and seen the fire eaten up like the vengeance of the angels. We seen it, young fella. It was a judgment. A judgment for the years of sin. <laughs> we didn't have to do no more caretaking after that night. Providence took care for us. You and Carl uh, caretakers, is that it? That's right. <laughs> only, only one wing to take care of now. Only one wing and him. Oh, the brother. Yes, yes, him that can't move or talk or hear. That's where they brung him, and that's where he stayed. Now, you get. I, I talked enough. I wonder. How do I get up there? You're still going up, huh? More than ever now. Which way? Yeah, straight up the canyon, turn left, it's top of the hill. Thanks. Well, maybe you should have picked a lighter night. Yes, one with a moon. <laughs> maybe she's right, Holiday. <laughs> Definitely no night for a picnic. But who said it's going to be a picnic? <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello? Anybody here? Hello? The same to you with feathers on. Hello? Oh. Light a match, Holiday. Don't be so stupid. Is anyone here? Mr. Chase? Oh, Mr. Chase. Holy mackerel. Who are you? Answer me. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice Barrett's own voice you got there, Holiday. Kling. Inspector Kling. Where am I? Hospital. What for? For your head. There's a little dent in it about two inches deep. Oh, I remember. Where is he? He? Who? The body. Oh, the body. What body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you get in? Who found me? Who told you all about this? The old girl, caretaker's wife. She found you. Oh. Kling, I saw a body in Fair Melrose. Holiday, I don't know what merry go round you're on, but keep up this way and you'll get the brass ring through your nose. How do I get out of this place? Walk out. Thanks. What are you going to do now? Why? I want to know where to pick up the body. Keep in touch, Kling. What have you got in mind? A date. A date with a beautiful young lady. Slightly hysterical and more than a little mysterious. But interesting. What do you want here again, Mr. Holliday? More to the point, what do you want? Will you please leave? Every time I come here, I get invited to leave. I don't know what you're doing, Mr. Holliday, but it's none of your business. You ought to... I went to Fair Melrose last night. What for? I wanted to see it. And your brother. You mustn't see him. Why not? What did he do, Miss Chase? Please leave him alone. All right. Did you go to Melrose last night? No. I haven't been there for ten years. You weren't there the night of the fire either, were you? No, no, I wasn't. All right, all right. I'll take your word for it. Now, mind if I ask you one more question? If you'll go, I'll answer it. It's a deal. What are you afraid of? Nothing. That's your answer? Yes. I, I'd almost forgotten that horrible night until you came here. For ten years, I've lived away from it, keeping it away from me. Now you've brought it all back. Don't you have any pity? Lots of it, Miss Chase. For a lot of people. Particularly you. What do you want to see him for? I've got to. I want to talk with him. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's in the only wing left by the fire. Well, that he is. You, you still want to go up to see him? Yes, I do. Oh, the chase is devil's brood, all of them. Devil's brood. The young and with her temper, screaming at her mother and father. And him that's upstairs now, always fighting with his sister. The fire was a visitation and a judgment of providence. Ah. Now, ah, there he is. Oh, no. Yeah, that's him. You stay here. Mr. Chase. Mr. Chase. Can't hear you, can't hear you, can't, can't. Shut up. Mr. Chase, I'm... I'm Dan Holliday. Box 13. 
Box 13, do you understand? Not in his head. That's all he can do. Mr. Chase, you wanted to see me. You sent me that book. You had Carl send it to me. Is that right? Nod your head if that's right. Good. Now why? He can hear. You can hear me a little, can't you, Mr. Chase? Good. Why did you send me that book? Why did you want me to come here? He wants me to look around, Bertha. At what? At what? Ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing. Look, Mr. Chase. I'll walk around the room. I'll watch you. When you want me to stop, nod your head. Understand? Good. Now watch me. Here, this trophy case. Is this it? What about it? What do you want me to see in this? Good. Bertha, come here. I ain't coming in. I said, come here, come on. Take a good look at this trophy case, Bertha. A good look. Uh, I don't see nothing. There's a plaque missing from its place. There's heavy dust around behind all those cups and trophies, but there's a clean spot here where a plaque stood. No dust, Bertha. No dust. Someone took a plaque from here not more than a few days ago. Did you? I ain't touched nothing. Never touched nothing. Mr. Chase. That plaque. Whose was it? Yours? No. Your father's? Mother's? Mildred's. It was hers. But someone took it. Mr. Chase, try to understand. Try to answer. Please, you've got to... He can't... Mr. He... Chase, try hard. Try hard to hear me Let again. Let him alone. He can't do no more. Stay with... Stay with him, Bertha. Don't leave him for a minute, do you hear? Oh, hello there. Hello, Holiday. Inspector, I'm in a hurry. No, it looks like it. But you can't spare a poor cop a couple of minutes to explain something, can't you? What? That body. We found it. In a ravine about a mile down the road. All right, you found the body. Now I'm in a hurry. I gotta Not go. Not so fast, Holiday. There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Later, Kling. Later. You know where to reach me? Holiday. Come back, Holiday. I say come back here. I'd be care of box 13. <laughs> You, you saw my brother, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I saw him. Oh, please keep playing. I don't know why I let you in here. I do. Can't you leave me alone? Please, the piano. I like to hear it. What did you find out? So you don't know why anyone would have taken that plaque from the trophy case? No! Your brother managed to tell me it was yours. He what? Where was it? In the lower right-hand corner of the trophy case. Lower right-hand corner? Lower? That mean anything? Well, it... It was a plaque I won for dramatics at Merrifield Academy. I don't get it. What value does it have? It isn't worth anything except... Except what? The plaque was presented to me at a dinner at Merrifield. So, go on. The dinner was the night of the fire at Melrose. And the plaque would prove you were at Merrifield the night of the fire. Yes. But somebody... Somebody wants people to think you were at Fair Melrose. Were you? No, no, no. How many times do I have to say that? That's enough. Who hates you, Miss Chase? My brother. Your brother? They all hated me. My mother, my father, my brother. Sometimes I think I hated them. Watching me, picking my friends, cutting me off from the friends I picked. I couldn't stand it. I any. see. All right, Miss Chase. We'll forget it for now. But can I come back this evening? Why? I said before I wanted to help you. That still goes. Miss Chase, it still goes. <laughs> Please sit down, Mr. Holliday. 
Thanks, Miss Chase. Do, uh, do you have anything to tell me? A few things, yes. But first, uh, is there anything you want to tell me? Tell you? Why, no. You sure? Positive. What could I tell you? A story. I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll explain. Must you play the piano? No, but I'd like to. Miss Chase, let me tell you a story. What about? Well, I don't know whether it's exact or not. You see, I have to guess a lot. Fill in details myself. But this story is about a girl, an 18-year-old girl. That is, she was 18 10 years ago. And what's that got to do with me? Oh, you might be the girl, Miss Chase. Wild with a temper. Bad temper. She had a lot of fights with her parents. Mostly about the friends she had. The way she ran around. What are you trying to say? That one night this girl set fire to her home in a fit of temper. After a fight with her parents. Maybe she didn't mean to do what she did. But the fire destroyed her home almost completely. It meant the death of her parents and it made her brother... A You're making this up. You're guessing. I said I'd have to guess. I was at Merrifield the night of the fire. For a while. I checked. Found out you left early enough to get to know those. And you brought a plaque with you. The one you'd won for dramatics. Well, I, I brought it to Melrose later. The, the next day or the next. I, I, I don't remember. No, that's no good, Miss Chase. It's too hard to believe that anyone would walk into a ruined home and put a plaque in a trophy case. I say you took it to Melrose. Then had the fight with your mother and father. You're lying. I don't think so. I took it there after the fire. And why is it missing? Want me to look around your apartment for it, Miss Chase? Or send for the police to look for it? No. Why not, if you haven't got it? Why are you afraid to let me look for it? So I am right. Now let's get on with the story. For ten years you held the secret. There's nothing to connect you with the fire at Melrose except that plaque. For years that fire's on your mind. Day after day you have to live with the secret. Wondering if there's anything that will connect you with that night. But there's nothing. There's nothing. Then you remember that plaque. It will prove that you were at Melrose. Because the date engraved on it is the same as the date of the fire. No, I tell you it's not true. So there's only one thing to do. Get that plaque out of Melrose. But you didn't count on one thing. Your brother. Day after day he saw that trophy case. Day after day it was the same. Never changing. Like the four walls he had to stare at. But suddenly it's different. There's... There's something missing. He racks his brains and he remembers. He remembers the plaque that was there. When he was able to read, he must have read about the fire. How you escaped the tragedy by being at school that night. How lucky everyone said you were. He read how you were presented with a plaque for dramatics. And his tortured mind puts two and two together. And he arrives at the conclusion that you were at Melrose. Home. The night of the fire. Well, Miss Chase, did you like that story? There's nothing you can prove. Maybe not. But how about Carl's murder? You killed him. Because you thought Carl was me last night. No. What, what are you doing? Calling the police. It's for them now. I think they'll prove you killed Carl. They're good at that sort of thing, Miss Chase. Very good. No, no, please. What do you want? Money? I'll give you money. Anything, only don't call them. Why not? Please, please. Hello, Inspector Lincoln. They hated me, all of them. Okay, I hated on. them, and you, I hate you. Let Look me out. Get Look out. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, Kling. Holiday. Come to the Sunview Apartments now. I, uh, I just rang down the curtain on a ten-year dramatic act. <laughs> been awful thrilling, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, sure, Susie. About as thrilling as throwing dirt in the guy's face. Oh. Well, here's some more mail for Box 13. Later, Susie, later. But here's something maybe you ought to look into. 
What? If you subscribe to this book club, you get a free set of Sir Walter Scott's poems. Oh, fine, fine. Good night, Sue. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager with an original story by Frank Hart Tausig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. (laughs) 